Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Hugh Paul Smith from CMC Microsystems, and I'd like to welcome everybody to this workshop, uh, AI for, for EDA CAD Challenges and Opportunities. And uh, I'd like to particularly thank our, our sponsor, Huawei, for um, not only suggesting this as a uh, uh, interesting topic for a workshop, but also providing some funds to help underwrite uh, the costs and, and make, uh, make the uh, registration free for attendees. So in terms of the uh, objectives of, of the workshop, we wanted to present some of the latest work uh, using AI and machine learning to improve CAD and EDA algorithms, uh, identify research challenges and opportunities in, in this area, um, hopefully identify some, some common infrastructure requirements uh, and, and maybe see where CMC can add some value in, in enabling research in this area and discuss uh, opportunities for collaboration. Um, so uh, in terms of the agenda, we have a number of uh, invited talks uh, from, from experts in uh, uh, AI and, and EDA CAD research. So uh, I'm just going to give a, a brief introduction to CMC Microsystems. Um, uh, CMC is a not-for-profit corporation uh, founded in 1984. We're the manager of Canada's National Design Network, which is a uh, major sciences in initiative uh, from, from CFI, um, one of 17 across the country. Uh, and we provide infrastructure for microsystems uh, design, uh, make, and test. And we provide uh, services to uh, simplify access and reduce cost uh, for advanced technologies in microelectronics, photonics, MEMS, nanofabrication, embedded systems, AI and machine learning, and, and quantum technologies. Uh, in terms of uh, what's Canada's National Design Network, this is a uh, Canada-wide collaboration between 67 universities and colleges across Canada, uh, which connects 10,000 academic participants and uh, 1,000 companies with which they uh, collaborate to design, make, and test micro and nanosystem prototypes. Um, in the last year, uh, we, we uh, I guess CMC measures its uh, its impact through the the outputs, the research outputs of, of its participants. And in, in the last year, um, those participants created uh, thirty um, almost thirty five hundred publications, uh, received one hundred and seventy awards, eighty five patents, uh, four hundred and fifty collaborations with industry, uh, ten new startups, and and uh, six hundred twenty five uh, trained HQP with the industry. Uh, CMC delivers its products and services and support through three um, major, three, three main uh, categories, CAD, FAB, and LAB. In terms of CAD, we provide access to uh, state-of-the-art commercial software for designing um, uh, novel devices and systems. Um, these are delivered through a secure distributed private cloud um, or, or, or also available on site. Uh, we also provide user guides, training, uh, process design kits uh, and all sorts of materials uh, for to make uh, make it easier to uh, learn these technologies and get get up and running with them um, and then from the from the CAD we move to the fab uh, where we provide access to multi-project wafer services in a number of technologies from microelectronics silicon photonics MEMS and, and nanofabrication and we also provide packaging and assembly services and then uh, for lab, we provide access to test equipment uh, for short-term loan. We provide access to FPGA-based uh, development systems and development boards, um, collaborative research projects funded through, uh, through MyTax or other, other funding organizations um, to develop platform, platform technologies that we can then offer to other researchers in, in the network. Uh, as I mentioned, we provide access to over 500 CAD tools and CAD modules from uh, a number of uh, commercial vendors uh, spanning the microelectronics design, uh, FPGA, embedded systems, uh, photonics, and MEMS. And we, we service over 5,000 uh, users annually. Uh, we provide uh, the, the, the tools are available for, for on-site use, but we also provide uh, design environments in the cloud uh, where um, these are pre-configured and set up for, for immediate use to get up and running quickly. Um, and uh, the, 
the design flows are also included in, in, in these environments. We also provide access to high performance computing uh, through a CAD compute cluster for accelerating uh, uh, re uh, resource intensive simulations and, and design work. We also have a uh, FPGA GPU cluster, which has eight nodes for uh, supporting AI training and inference uh, as an example. These are all available online through, through CMC's network. Uh, we also provide access to uh, MPW low volume prototyping services and dedicated runs uh, in a number of technologies. And I just highlight that we've uh, recently revised our subscriber pricing for, for prototyping. So uh, it's, it's very advantageous right now to uh, prototype in, in a lot of these technologies. And there's more information on our website on, on the pricing and how to get access to uh, uh, manufacturing. And then the lab, as I mentioned, uh, we provide uh, test equipment through our equipment rental. We have a number of design platforms around uh, RISC-V uh, platforms, FPGA development systems. Uh, we have a Git, GitHub with uh, a number of uh, uh, development projects that, uh, that researchers can, can use. Uh, and research, uh, the equipment uh, rental program has access to over 80 high value pieces of equipment uh, that can be um, reserved uh, for, for short term for testing um, uh, chips that are uh, manufactured through our, our services. So um, I guess uh, we'll, we'll get started with the, the main program. Um, and our, our first uh, presenters are Dr. Andre Ivanov and Sebastian Zhu from University of British Columbia. Um, Dr. Ivanov is a professor of electrical and computer engineering at UBC. He has published widely on many research topics related to, design, to, the, to the design and test of uh, system on chips, systems on chip, and is an inventor of several patents. He's a golden core member of the Computer Society, a fellow of the IEEE, a fellow of the Canadian Ac Academy of Engineering, a fellow of the Engineering Institute of Canada, and a professional engineer of British Columbia, Dr. Ivanov's uh, Current research interests are focused on new solutions and methodologies aimed at addressing reliability issues arising in SOCs in Internet of Things applications. These methodologies include molecular dynamic simulations combined with machine learning approaches. Dr. Ivanov is also pursuing research in machine learning applications to uh, EDA of SOCs. And his student is Sebastian Zhu, is a PhD candidate in uh, Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at UBC. He has had one and a half years of EDA industrial working experience at an EDA startup company and at Synopsys. His doctoral research investigates the optimization of SOC global routing techniques. Uh, the current project is focused on developing routability driven routing strategies, which includes deep learning based congestion estimations and congestion aware routing algorithms. Uh, so I guess I'll turn it over uh, to Andre and Sebastian if they want to uh, unmute their mics. Thanks. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Hugh, for the uh, very elaborate and kind introduction. Uh, I'd like to um, uh, greet everyone in our virtual room here. Um, we all know how it would have been nice to be in the same physical room. Uh, but uh, given the circumstances, this is probably the best we can do. And I would like to thank uh, Huawei and CMC for, uh, for bringing us together uh, today. And I look forward to the, uh, to the conversations and the presentations that, uh, that are forthcoming. So again, thank you and greetings to you all. Um, in spite of all the credentials that uh, Hugh mentioned, the real expert here, I believe, uh, is uh, my PhD student or PhD student working, who has been working with me over the years, uh, or over the last few years, uh, on uh, machine learning applications to uh, EDA, and that's uh, Sebastian here, who's in the room. And I have another student who I believe, uh, I believe is joining us from China today, uh, Ethan uh, uh, Pan who's in the room as well, who's, uh, who's working or volunteered to work on this uh, interesting problem uh, with, uh, with me and, and uh, in my group. So without further ado, f further ado I'd like to uh, pass it on to Sebastian to uh, report uh, to all of you some of our recent uh, work uh, in this area and to uh, follow up with some uh, insightful discussions with all of you. So thank you again, and Sebastian, I pass it on to you.
Okay, thank you, Idri. So, um, let me share my screen first. Okay. All right, so hello everyone. It's really happy to see you here in the virtual meeting room. So my name's Sebastian and my supervisor is Andre Ivanov and my co-supervisor is Dr. Uh, Guy Lemieux. So today I would like to share with you guys my latest work. So it's called Neural Network for EDA Routability Driven Global Routing. I call it Medusa. So let's take a look at a little background before we jump into my work. So backend phase is also called a design, uh, physical design phase. It's one of the two important stages that form the EDA design. There are three main stages at the backend design phase, floor planning, placement, and routing. And our work is mainly focused on the routing phase because routing is one of the most time consuming and also most complex stage of all the three. So how does the router know how to route a design? So say that we have a physical design on the very left hand side. This is a design that we human can visually observe but the router doesn't know this information. So how does the router transform the physical design into some logical data and then perform the routing? It does three stages. So first of all, it will apply a grid on top of the design. And based on this grid, we will use a black dot to represent each of the tiles and use a line to represent the edges that is a, a crossing, uh, that is around this certain tile. So once this topology is formed, we will remove the grid and the final topology it will be used for the global routing to do the route. And let's talk about the routing. So what exactly is routing? The routing is a path fighting algorithm. So what does the path fighting algorithm do? So let's take a example, a very, very simple example here. So let's say we have a five by five grid and uh, we have a source and ping pair. This person here wants to go back home. So how many choices do we have here? How many uh, monotonic choices do we have here? Let's take a deeper look into the example here. So we can definitely just let this person directly go to home from the very left to the very right. And we can make a little detour to make the person exercise a little, or we can you know, take the longest route. So you might think everyone would choose to do the red line to make the people go back home. But in reality, what is actually happening is that if you take the red line, it's gonna take you 10 hours to go back home. And if you take the, the blue line, it's gonna take you two hours. And if you wanna take the longest line, you are actually going, only going to take 20 minutes. So why is that? Let's take a step back and take a look at the topographic map. Now we know that, okay, there are mountains and an ocean and a bridge between the person and the home. So if we are using the red line, the poor soul has to climb over a mountain to go back home. That's why he takes 10 hours to do so. So if we take the, the blue line, it takes about uh, two hours because this guy has to swim uh, across the ocean. But if we use the green line, this guy only has to drive through a bridge to go back home. So. This shows the importance of knowing the situation before doing the actual path fighting. So in reality, when we are routing a circuit, the problem would only go into be worse, be worsened. So we, we were going to have a much larger routing area and the routing area, the routing grid will have a different uh, tile size as I have shown here. Some of the tiles are larger than the others and also instead of a source and pink pair, we sometimes have a multi-source and sync set. Uh, this example here, you can see that this two person, they have to go back home together. It means we have to connect this two person first 
And this two person only has to go back to one of the three homes. So everything's making the problem more complicated. So knowing the congestion map beforehand, before the actual routing is of critical importance. So how does, a, the, how does the research field has been dealing with this problem? Uh, mainly uh, the, the academic world has been solving a decision problem, whether a current tile has a DRC violation or not. So say we have a design, a logical topolo routing topology on the left-hand side, and we have a condition prediction model using machine learning, it will output a binary, uh, for, uh, it will generate a binary output is either one or zero. If it's one, that means a current target cell has DRC violations. If it's zero, that means the current target cell is free of DRC violations. So you would definitely wonder, so if we're only knowing whether the current tile has a red flag or not, so how do we know whether it's a mountain or the ocean or is a bridge? So here comes our work. We call it Medusa because it's, the name is the machine learning condition prediction using a multi-channel features. Think about all these snake heads as different uh, features. So we, instead of solving a uh, decision problem, we are solving a regression problem. We are, so we are calculating the severity of the current tile that has the congestion, that has the overflow. So by using our predicted, uh, by using our prediction model, we can tell which cells, not only can we tell which cells has condition, but also we, we know the congestion, the severeness of each cell. So how do we do it? This is the flow chart of our proposed work. So generally speaking, there are two main portions of our work. One is called a data preparation and the other one is the model training. At the very beginning of our work, the input is called a placed net list. Recall that uh, the one stage before routing is the placement. So this placed net list includes all the all the primitives that, that has already been placed on the circuit board without any routing has been performed. Once this netlist is uh, written to the router, the router will generate a graph. So during the, the graph generation period, if the data preparation switch is on, our feature extraction algorithm will cut in and extract different kinds of features from the graph. And currently we have six different kinds of uh, features. And once the graph is generated, the router will perform the global routing and generate a real condition report. And based on this real condition report, we label the report, uh, we label the congestion. And this congestion in two directions, horizontal and vertical will be used as the output target for the prediction. So once our data has been prepared, we're moving to the second stage, which is called a model training. <clears throat> because the feature and targets of one design is too large for a model to train, we, we, we chop the data into smaller pieces. And once the features and targets has been chopped, we will fit in into the model to do the training. And so during the training iterations has been going, we closely monitor the convergence of the model. If it's converged, then we say this model is trained and we can use it as a condition predictor. And if it's not converged, unfortunately, we have to go back to do the reconfiguration such as uh, returning the uh, loss functions, uh, learning rate, might, we, we might even change the layer, layer properties. So after this diagram, uh, let's take a look at what the data, what the features look like. So our features are actually images, but other than our other, others work, our images are generated by our own feature extraction algorithm, which brings two uh, advantages. So our algorithm does not depend on the routing tools output. So it doesn't matter if you're using a cadence a, a tool or synopsis tool, as long as you can, we have the access to the source code, we can directly use their data structure, the data stored in it to generate 
the uh, corresponding images that we want as the output, as the features. And also it's independent from the input format. And if you're using left and DAF and or if you're using bookshelf, it doesn't matter. As long as your data can be read into the router, we can use the data to generate images. Uh, as is shown here, we have, I have shown four different features. Uh, the first one is called capacity. The brighter area means it has a higher number of nets that can go across each region. And the second one is the net connections. As you can see here, these are all the virtual NAS connections between pins on the circuit. And also we have the pin locations where it shows you all the pins exact physical locations. And also finally the congestion, the target we're going to predict. So this is the features. How, so how does the model look like? Most of the work trying to uh, develop really sophisticated uh, model or learning models, but we are doing the opposite way. We want to simplify a machine learning model. We want to push a model's limit. So we developed a really, really simple model as it, which is shown here, a partial encoder, a customized neural net, which only contains uh, convolutional layers. A, in the input and output layers, there are also images. So by simplifying the machine learning model, we achieve four uh, advantages. So smaller model means we have a faster training and converging time circle. And also smaller uh, module means we can use lower memory usage. And if you're using the trained model, that also means we have a faster prediction time. And also if we don't have a trained model, that means easier, uh, that means simpler model can makes us as easy, can makes it easier for us to tune the model for retraining. So uh, let's take at the results. So by using our uh, features and models, we can uh, we can do the prediction. And this is a visual comparison of the congestion map. The congestion map has been visualized uh, using this heat map. On the very left column is the ground truth of two randomly chosen examples. And on the very right hand side is our latest work is called the Medusa. And in the middle, the Rudy one is, um, sorry, there's a typo here. It should be Rudy. So the Rudy work is a really famous net density calculation for congestion estimation that has been around for more than a decade. And the second work is our previous machine learning application in congestion estimation. As you can see, the very famous Rudy work, they tend to uh, underestimate the congestion because the brightness of this congestion map is somehow lower than the ground truth. But the pattern of the Rudy looks fine to the ground truth. And our previous look, uh, our previous work has a problem of, uh, of the noise here, you can see, that makes the pattern doesn't re look really similar to the ground truth. But our latest work, Medusa, can achieve both the similarity in the pattern and also the brightness. So this is the images that we human can visually observe, but the router doesn't know this image. The router doesn't, uh, the, the router only cares about the data. So how does the data actually look like to the router? So first of all, we investigate the condition estimation quality by using two different indexes. The first one is called a PCC, the Pearson Correlation Coefficient. And the other one is called an M NRMSE, which is the normalized MSE. So this correlation is the pixels is the pixels between the con uh, predicted congestion map and the ground truth pixels. And this final value is the average of each of the benchmarks of, of all the 15 benchmarks. As you can see here, our Medusa work achieved 0 0.95 uh, PCC, which is the highest among my previous work and the popular work of Rudy. And the same goes for the NRMSE. Our work is also the best one among the three work. So once we have the better congestion estimation, how does it, how does it work on 
the, the, the global router. So we use our congestion estimation map to guide the global routing using the same global router. So as you can see here on the table two, the first of all, the first thing that we achieved is we can have a fewer initial routing overflow up to uh, 30%. So this initial routing overflow reduction means we have a better initial global routing solution. A better global routing solution means we have, we only need to do, a f we, we, we will do fewer optimization or iterations. So, which is shown here on the right-hand side here. So a fewer initial routing overflow directly resulted in a fewer routing iterations. So don't ignore this 5% reduction in routing iterations. In, uh, in practical, in industrial design, every iteration counts. Every single iteration can, can cost you up to hours of time. So even a 5% reduction uh, uh, considering the absolute value of reduction is actually 40 iterations, the, the runtime ac uh, acceleration can be huge. So besides the congestion estimation, we also developed a uh, global routing strategy. We call it UBC route. So it is a four stage global routing algorithm. It has four uh, different cost functions uh, focusing on different objectives, the four, so we call it four routing strategies. Instead of route, do the routing, uh, trying to optimize all different objectives, objectives at once, we separate these objectives and just optimize one at each time. We first uh, try to reduce the wire length and then we try to reduce congestion. And thirdly, we try to uh, figured out the forbidden regions, which are the highly congested regions. And we, we forever forbidden those regions to be further routed. And then we do the post-processing. So combined with this, our global routing algorithm and our Medusa congestion estimation, as shown here, we do the, the whole global routing uh, on all 15 benchmarks and we compared with the other three available academic uh, routers. Here is the final global routing runtime comparison. As you can see here, comparing with, comparing with the best and also uh, the latest global router at the time I've done this research, uh, we, have, we can achieve at least three times uh, overall runtime speed up. So, in overall, we show that the importance of having a congestion estimation before the routing uh, has been performed. So, so we designed a congestion estimation algorithm. By <clears throat> congestion estimation algorithm, we, <clears throat> we, I, we mean we developed a feature extraction method, which is independent from the input uh, format and also the tools of developer's choice. And also in cooperate with the features, we have a customized neural network which aimed at this, which aim at the simplification. We achieve a very high accuracy while the structure of the neural network is really simple. Is, is really simple. So by using our uh, congestion estimation algorithm, we achieved a better congestion map and a better initial routing solution. And this better routing solution will end up having, uh, making us having a fewer optimization iterations and also in the end, a much faster global routing runtime. So this is very important for the, uh, uh, for the industry, EDA industry because uh, the time is money. So reducing the product to market circle would definitely benefit everyone in this industry. But we are we we still facing some challenges. The one of the biggest challenges is that we still the scalability of, of our work is still unknown, mainly due to two reasons. The circuit benchmarks that we currently are using and testing are contest benchmarks that are provided by industries and institutions and modified based on real designs. So they're relatively small by relative. I mean, comparing with uh, the latest real uh, industrial chips. And also 
the source code of industrial routing tools, they are non-free and we have no access to the source code of the industrial design. So we have no way of testing the impact of our congestion estimation algorithm on the real industrial routing tools. And also the other small minor challenges is about the integration problem. As a lot of people has been facing, the tools are written in C or C, C++ while most uh, machine learning frameworks are written in Python. So the language differences makes a interconnection inefficient. So it is doable, but there are ways to accelerate this inefficiency issue. And it's we and we're exploring all the possibilities for now. Uh, lastly, I want to thank uh, UBC, Huawei, and ANSIC for providing the funding for my research and also the guidance from my uh, supervisor, Andre, and also Guy, and also uh, the scholar, scholar, uh, the visiting scholar from National Tsinghua University, Dr. Ho, for continuing support throughout my years of my research. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your time. And I look forward to seeing the rest of the presentations today. Okay, uh, thanks a lot. I guess we'll, we'll move along to the uh, next presenter. Um, Dr. Brett Mayer is an associate professor in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at McGill University. He joined McGill in 2011 after over a year as a PDF at the University of Virginia. He received his PhD from Carnegie Mellon in 2009. He has published over 50 articles related to his diverse research interests. While in general, his work focuses, focuses on architectures and design algorithms for embedded computer systems, recent work investigates embedded system security and machine learning. So, uh, Brett, please go ahead. Thank you very much, Hugh, for that introduction. Um, before I get into it, I want to acknowledge my uh, colleague and collaborator, uh, Professor Warren Gross, and the graduate student that made this work possible, Alex Yin. Uh, so we're going to step back now from the low-level details of EDA and start talking a little bit about sort of system-level hardware software co-design, um, specifically machine learning co-design. So there's been a lot of work in the last couple of years looking at how to make artificial neural networks run more efficiently, especially on embedded and mobile devices that are resource constrained compared to the powerhouse cloud and, and server devices that we have that we use for training. Um, sometimes these devices just rely on 8-bit linear algebra libraries in order to make their neural networks go. And uh, we need them to run quickly or in an energy efficient way. Um, but how? Uh, when we're designing neural networks, we pick our hyperparameters in order to try to achieve accuracy usually, but the same choices in hyperparameter selection in terms of the number of layers and how many neurons in each layer and, and, and other such things, they also have uh, tremendous implications for energy and delay. Um, so we want to make our neural networks run efficiently, and we have a variety of different types of hardware that we might want to target. How do we do this? Uh, especially when, if you look at the design space of neural networks, there's really not, at least for our understanding today, an intuitive pattern that relates the structure of a neural network and its performance especially if you're considering different architectures that might have different memory hierarchies and, and, and other such things. Um, just as an example of, of what this can look like, I have um, a graphical representation of three different neural networks that all achieve the same accuracy. Uh, so we have this first one, and it's got um, a number of convolutional neural uh, convolutional layers before a couple of fully connected layers. And then this one has more convolutional layers, but they often have fewer filters than the one that's up here. Um, it ends up being over two times as expensive to execute. And then we have this other one down here, which has um, uh, about the same number of layers, maybe uh, fewer than the top one, but because of the complexity of those layers comes in at a fraction of the cost. And, and clearly if we're optimizing for the edge for IoT and so on, we want this one. Uh, in fact, if you're optimizing for running on AWS, you want this one. 
the longer it takes your model to run in the cloud, the more it's going to cost you. So if we're, if we're thinking about an inaccuracy goal, we definitely want to achieve it as cheaply as possible. Uh, so what we've been working on is a tool that we call OPAL, Ordinary People Accelerating Learning. And um, it's basically neural networks designing neural networks. The, the terminology that's being used to describe our particular approach to doing this is called sequential model-based optimization. And the way that this works is that we train a neural network to be able to relate the parameters of a neural network, um, the, its particular structure, with its uh, metrics. So we have some meta deep neural network and uh, you feed it in the structure of the neural network that we're designing and it'll make a guess about the accuracy. Uh, and then we can take that same uh, target neural network that we're designing and run it, run it through inference to see how long it takes or perform an energy optimization and use the prediction about its accuracy and an evaluation of its delay or energy and so on in order to try to decide whether or not this particular meta uh, target, DN, uh, target neural network is worth evaluating. Now, what's super interesting in designing neural networks as a CAD problem is that if I want to know actually how good a neural network is going to be, it can take me hours or days to train a neural network. Evaluating inference delay or energy is really easy. And that's absolutely a thing that uh, computer engineers excel at. We've got performance models and power models. Um, that's very well established research. But figuring out how accurate a neural network is going to be, the only way to really know for sure is to train it. Um, and so we want to avoid doing training as much as we possibly can because it's extraordinarily expensive. And our goal then in this particular case is to figure out what are all the good and interesting models, ones that strike interesting trade-offs between accuracy and whatever our performance metric is. And we wanna identify those as rapidly as we can. Um, the design space is tremendously large and we, we can't afford to evaluate very much of it. So the basic approach that our tool takes is that we define a design space and then we pick one, pick a model at random. And let's just say that it's this triangle right here that we end up picking. Um, we ask our neural network if that one is any good and it tells us yes because it doesn't know any better. We're starting from random weights in our meta deep neural network. And so then we choose to evaluate it. We train it up and then we uh, add its result, this data point right here into its training set. Now we can start to train our, our artificial neural network to make better predictions. And this process repeats. I've got 20 iterations showing here, 20 different designs that were picked. And already we have a Predo optimal front that is beginning to appear here. Now the purpose of this loop is to try to find points that are to the left of this proto optimal front. Ideally, we want the lowest air possible for the lowest cost, where the cost is latency or energy. And so we go around looking for a solution and we ask, is the solution better than anything that we've seen before? Is it to the lower left? If no, then we go back and pick another one over and over and over again. If it is, if we do find one that's on the left here, then we train it, add it to the data set, retrain our meta network and continue. Um, and what we observe in general is that this works pretty well. After a hundred iterations, we've got a much better proto optimal front before, some interesting trade-offs between uh, relatively higher air, um, and lower cost or lower air and higher cost. And the longer that we're willing to do this, the better kinds of results we get. Uh, my animation stops at 500. We don't find that we get too much improvement beyond there. Um, and this is all well and good. And in general, we find that the tool does a pretty good job this meta network does a pretty good job with limited data making predictions about what kinds of neural networks 
networks are going to perform well. Um, one example that we have shown here is we identified a small design space and we evaluated every single neural network in it. And every single neural network is then represented by a little diamond here. Uh, so we then ran our tool and it evaluated these red diamonds. And the first thing to note is that the red diamonds tend to be clustered over at this proto-optimal front. That's good. So we're spending our training effort well. Um, and the Pareto-optimal front that our tool identifies is actually pretty close to the actual Pareto-optimal front. That's also good news. Um, and just a couple other quick takeaways here is that uh, the range in cost for a single error target is actually really large. So it's never enough, especially if we're talking about Edge or IoT, to identify an error metric and then just go and pick the first thing that you find that meets it. Because you have, um, oh, it's about 20x variation in this simple example. And it can be larger depending on the problem that you're trying to solve. Likewise, if you have a cost metric, for instance, for a real-time system, maybe you can um, pay a certain amount in terms of inference delay, the variation in error can also be quite large along there. So we need, clearly we need tools and um, Opal does a pretty reasonable job with a huge caveat. So the original formulation of our tool is essentially trying to work out this optimal stopping problem. Um, we keep sampling designs, looking for one that improves upon the credo optimal front, but eventually, if we don't find one, we just train something, anything to try to improve the prediction accuracy of our model. Um, and what that means is that as the experiment goes on, it becomes harder and harder to find preto-optimal designs. Um, and basically you can only find good designs if you can make good predictions. So we did another simple experiment with another exhaustively explored design space. Every one of these little crosses is a different uh, neural network model. And we asked the question, how good of a job could we do if our prediction of model accuracy was perfect? If we had an oracle. And so if we have an oracle, then we get these squares. And um, it does a lot better than deterministic search, where we just try to pick a design, see if it's better. If it's not, try to pick another one. And what we observed is that we need some way to manage this prediction error. We need some way to deal with the fact that our meta network isn't exactly right when it comes to predicting how accurate these models are gonna be. And that's where probabilistic uh, sequential model-based optimization comes in. The basic idea is that because of uncertainty in the neural network, we don't know for sure that a model is going to be better. There's a really a probability that it's going to be. So we have some candidate X and some previously measured design lambda. There's some chance, given the error of the meta network, that it'll be better, some chance that it will be worse. And what we really want to do is we want to look for the designs that have the best probability of being better than things that we've observed before. Now, we assume once we train a model, that we no longer have uncertainty in terms of its accuracy. But um, latency measurements are inherently noisy um, because of caching, because of other things that uh, systems are doing. So we've got this variation here in the x-axis for the latency of the neural network. And what we devised is a probabilistic Pareto efficiency metric that combines the probability that our candidate x uh, is not dominated, meaning it's to the left of the Pareto optimal front, and also the number of designs that it dominates. Um, and with this, we're able to build a new loop here, which performs remarkably better than our initial formulation. Um, instead of just picking one design out of the search space and asking the meta network how it does, now we pick a fixed number, 100. And what we do is we pick the one candidate out of that 100 that is expected to perform the best. And that's what we train. And that goes into the, the, tra uh, the training data for the response surface and so on. 
So we're, we're not looking for that lottery ticket out of the search space that we are walking randomly and then evaluating. We, we pick 100, choose the best one for evaluation, and then move on from there. And the results are pretty striking. So for cats versus dogs, uh, we made a comparison with our deterministic search and we have our probabilistic search over here. And then we have mobile nets and then dense net. Uh, mobile nets and dense net are two different state-of-the-art approaches to uh, relatively lower cost inference. And you can see here that uh, the latency improvement over mobile nets is rather dramatic for about the same cost on this. Cats versus dogs is probably my favorite fake machine learning problem. It's a, a Kaggle competition. Uh, all you have to do is train something to identify cats versus dogs. I'm not sure it has any real world application, um, but it's a, a, a great simple classification problem. Uh, on a more complex one, CIFAR 10, you can see again, while DenseNet is able to achieve lower error, it's at an order of magnitude higher cost than uh, some of the designs that we find with probabilistic search here. And again, mobile nets remains much more expensive. On traffic signs, same deal. And finally, Google Street View. Uh, the mobile nets, they've been designed uh, in general, not for these embedded vision problems that tend to have lower resolution uh, images. Um, another case where you want to sort of grow your own computer vision solution. Um, but to do so, you have to manage the uncertainty that goes along with making predictions about the performance of your systems. But just to summarize here, um, we're going to see, I think, and we, we see in the course of this workshop today, the fact that machine learning is going to be used for doing design automation all over the place. But a fundamental issue is going to be the accuracy of the algorithms that we use to make these predictions. If you can have an oracle, you can do a tremendous job in the neural network design problem. Um, but we don't. And so the only way to move forward is to grapple with the uncertainty of these estimations. Um, they allow us to pick designs that are expected to be better than the ones we've observed so far. And this results in uh, far superior implementations compared to our prior work, as well as the state of the art uh, in neural network design. Thank you. Anyways, we'll move on to um... Dr. Lale Be Bejat. Um, uh, Dr. Bejat is a professor at the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at University of Calgary. She's also the NSERT Chair for Women in Science and Engineering for the Prairie Region. Her research focuses, focuses on developing mathematical techniques and software tools for automating design of digital integrated circuits. She has won several awards for her work. Uh, she's also passionate about increasing the status of women in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, and works towards building a more inclusive, equitable, and just society. Dr. Beja. Thank you very much. Can you all hear me? Yes. Yeah, and I uh, know Brett was in the mic uh, in a Minecraft world, and I decided to go to Lake Louise Ski Hill and present from there. So I have the talk, my, my talk will be on how will we make machines that make machines. So hopefully we'll all be out of a job in 10, 20 years. Uh, hopefully for me, but not so hopefully for the graduate students who are working there. But, but I'm also, also uh, just uh, joking. But before I start, I would like to acknowledge that in the spirit of reconciliation, I live and work and play on the traditional territories of the Blackfoot Confederacy, which includes Siksika, Pika, Kanai, Pikani, and Sut uh, Sutina, Nakoda Nations, and the Medi Nation Region 3, and all the people who make their home in the Treaty 7 region of Southern Alberta. Um, so the, one of the biggest questions is that uh, in the EDA design is that what the main task of our job is, uh, main, our main task is, is to fit all of the transistors and wires that connect uh, that connect these transistors inside the chip. And the picture in uh, this slide shows a three nanometer 
um, uh, transistors uh, that uh, we will be hopefully using at some point soon. But the whole question is, how do we do this? And the skill that we have are have grown r very rapidly. So, for example, a lot of the uh, phones that we have have about 10 billion transistors in them. Now, if we look a little bit more be behind the uh, consumer use electronics, we can see the Celebra's um, uh, uh, chip that came out and it had 1.2 trillion transistors. And that's a lot larger than the largest GPU with 21 billion transistors that have, that we're in it. And so the question is, how do we fit 1.2 uh, trillion transistors inside the chip? And the answer that I would like to say is that we would like to have our machines and our algorithms and our EDA tools a lot more uh, intelligent that, than, um, than what they are at the moment. So basically, we need to make sure that the machines are intelligent enough to make themselves because the scales that they have now and the, uh, the massive increase in their scales will make it a lot uh, harder to do. Now, whenever I talk about machine intelligence, people think about a robot that's going to come and kill you. Uh, but this is not really what I mean. So I went through and found three definitions of intelligence that I really like. So the first one is measured. Intelligence is measured by capacity to remember and predict patterns in the world, including language, mathematics, physical properties, and objects and social situations. And this is Jeff Hawkins uh, definition of intelligence in 2004. And I'll go through the other two in a few seconds, but let's just have a look at this and see if EDA algorithms are in uh, sort of uh, getting to where the first definition of intelligence is. So if the intelligence is the capacity to remember, we know that machines can remember much, much better than humans and then predict patterns in the world. So I wanna talk about one work that my group have done on predicting patterns in the world. And then we can go on and see during the other talks today that other patterns that are predicted through the wonderful algorithms that uh, Canadian researchers are working on. So this is my the team that worked on this uh, work with me. The work is called A Predictor. And, um, so basically, it's on the placement problem where we have all the modules in the cell, and we want to put this in the best locations uh, possible. In the picture on the left, these uh, cells or these modules are shown by red values, and you can see that they're getting spread out across the whole circuit. When you give the, the netlist uh, to as an input to the placement problem, then you sort of try to uh, spread the cells and put them in as a optimal locations as possible. Then you make sure that these places that they're put in are legal. And then you go in and sort of make sort of um, uh, localize improvements through detailed placement. So this is a placement problem. And one of the biggest problems is uh, for the placement is that no matter how good we make the placement, when we get to the detailed routing, things will go very wrong. And in the figure on the left, it's shown one of the circuits that we were working on and the, the placement was really, really optimal in our opinion. And when we did the detailed routing, we could see all these dots that show the, where the violations in detailed routing are happening. So the question is, uh, and the detailed routing takes a long time. So the question we had is, can we predict before doing detailed routing where the, the, these violations are gonna happen? And can we make them uh, less? Um, can we make them go away? So, quick question about where a quick uh, description of where these um, these uh, these violations are. So here we have uh, two metal layers, metal one and metal two, and uh, which metal two is a pre-routed wire, and we can see that there is a shorted pin on metal one here. Now we can easily move the, the cell over and uh, reduce the amount of this short, uh, but there can be another place that we have uh, a, a shorted pin, but there's no place to move the routed wire. And that's why the detailed placement can take a long time because if your placement does not have a lot of um, wider space, then there would be no place to reduce these shorts. 
or take away these terms. So the main idea here was to add a, a, a point for prediction, another step for prediction in between legalization and detailed placement. And so when we do the prediction, we find there will be some short somewhere, we actually add a correction step and go back to legalization and say, okay, we need to fix these problems before uh, moving forward. So the proposed prediction method was a quite simple neural network. We placed the uh, circuits, uh, we gave the place circuits to a router, we found the violations. And on the other hand, we did data extract, data collection and the feature extractions. And then we gave the features to and the violations to a learning model. And then we had the violation predictions. And the two data collection feature extraction and the learning models was uh, basically the part that the prediction all happens. So this is sort of the data collection. We did it using the ISPD 2015 benchmark circuits and we had 80% of the training set for 80% uh, of the tiles for a training set and 20% of them plus one of the circuits for cross validation. And I'm just showing a few of the features. We had over 30 uh, features extracted. So some of the features were uh, related to the location of the cell. So you can see on the purple on the left, the location is in wedged in between two macro blocks. And so that's a very congested location. But um, even if the log location itself is not congested, we could see congestion around the location and that could actually be an indicator that there will be shorts. And this is shown in the, um, in the picture on the right with uh, the green tile, which doesn't have any shorts and the purple tile that might have some shorts. And there were other types of uh, features that related maybe to the density, the cell density or the pin density of the circuit. So we had a, a neural network with four hidden layers. And basically once we trained the neural network, we had a uh, overall positivity, a true positive rate of 93%. Of course, if we had a lot more uh, shorts, our, our rate was higher. And when we had few shorts, then we uh, we had a, about 73% uh, of the uh, TPR. And then our specificity was overall 93%. And uh, this one, it was totally flipped. So if we had many shorts, our specificity went down. And if we have a few shorts, our specificity was high. So this was good. And uh, you could see one of the, 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 the sort of a comparison between our prediction and the global routing and the actual detailed routing. And the global routing would um, basically, what it would do is it will take a lot longer, but also over predict a lot. We over predicted the shorts, but we were closer to the actual detailed routing than what the global routing was. And I have shown a, a sort of a runtime here. After we had done the training, our prediction was only a fraction of time compared to the four days that the detailed routing could take. So what is the bigger uh, picture consequences of uh, this is that, uh, well, the first definition of our intelligence was that we could remember and predict patterns. And uh, we can show with this simple example that EDA algorithms can remember and predict patterns and they're pretty good at that too. So the second one is uh, the, uh, the definition of intelligence is the ability to learn, understand and make judgments or have opinions that are based on reason. And this is based on the Cambridge Advanced uh, Learners Dictionary from 2006. And so I want to see if we could have algorithms that learn, understand, and actually make judgments. And so I'm going to talk about a, a project we did for the routing um, and on detailed routing. So detailed routing itself is very complicated, and there are many constraints, and there are no good models for optimization. So the question we ask is, can we actually use machine learning to solve the detailed routing problem? And um, can we sort of make the machine route itself? And we knew that machine learning needs data. And unfortunately, we only had four benchmarks from ISPD 2019 available at the time when we were doing this research. So we didn't have the amount of data that was needed for this. 
However, we got the inspiration from AlphaGo Zero, which was developed by uh, Google. And AlphaGo Zero is uh, basically an um, algorithm to play the game of Go. Uh, but in the AlphaGo Zero, they use reinforcement learning. However, instead of the machine learning from humans on how to play the game, the machine learned to play the game by playing itself. So starting from uh, from nothing, knowing nothing about the game by doing moves and learning how to play itself, it actually could beat not only the board's uh, human master, but also the AlphaGo, the previous version where the learning was through a human. And so basically the catalyst for this sort of a thinking was that the game of Go, the board looks very much like the grid layers on the detailed routing. And, and so the idea was, could we actually turn the um, AlphaGo into a two player game? And after doing a lot of different trial, and this is the creative team that uh, worked on this. After doing a lot of different trials, we decided that we needed to keep uh, the game as a two player game. So one player was our router. And the other player was a cleaner, which would go around and clean up all the uh, mess that the router had done. So the router would route without thinking about many violations and the cleaner was cleaning uh, the, the violations and uh, sort of asking the router to reroute them. So just an example is uh, there is a, like three nets shown by yellow, blue and orange. And we can see that on uh, a square number 12, we have a violation. So, um, and the router has just used a star. So the cleaner finds the violation and rips up one of the not routes and then needs to, uh, and then the router has to reroute it. However, what we found is that because we had made this game as a, col a, comp a competitive game where the routing wanted to do the best job at the routing, making the routes as, as short as possible, and the cleaner wanted to uh, make the best cleaning job, and so fastest was the, the merit, how it got merit, it, the results were basically not at all good. And we sort of thought that this sounded like we were getting into a Nash equilibrium. And I don't know if you have heard of a Nash equilibrium, if um, sort of an easy way to explain it is if there is an ice cream truck on the beach, there everybody has to come to the middle to buy the ice cream. If there are two ice cream trucks, uh, they will always go to the middle because then they would each claim one half of the beach. But, uh, but unfortunately for the people who are at the two ends of the beach, they have to walk the longest to get there. So this might be a good position for the equilibrium position for the two trucks and the ice cream sellers, but not for the people who are going on uh, to, do, to buy those ice cream from the end of the, uh, the uh, from the end of the beach. And the optimal location is a one quarter and three quarter locations. So based on this, we thought that instead of getting the router and um, the cleaner to sort of uh, to compete with each other, we could actually make them to collaborate. And the collaboration was that we basically took the two rewards they were getting and swapped them. So the, the, the cleaner would get rewards when the router could find the, find the route, which was the shortest uh, route. Uh, and the router would get rewarded when the cleaner didn't have any jobs to do. So the cleaner could uh, say, oh, I don't have any nets to, uh, to reduce, uh, to, th there's no violations or the number of violations have become much less than previously. So in that case, then uh, we, we, they would get actually really good solutions. So what are the bigger picture consequences here is the, we said that the intelligence is the ability to learn, understand and make judgments or have opinions that are based on reason. And we could see with this one example is that EDA algorithms could learn and understand and sometimes even make good judgments than uh, better judgments than human did if we had given them the correct rewards. And so they learn based on actually collaborating with one another versus competing with one another. So this is the last one of the intelligence definitions. And uh, it says that the intelligence is sensory capacity, capacity for 
perpetual recognitions, quickness, range, or flexibility, or association. And the facility and imagination and span of attention. And unfortunately, I wanted to highlight the imagination, but uh, I uh, did the span of attention. So, and this is sort of what I think is, shows a little bit more of the meaning of intelligence as we know it and as we can use to solve our biggest problems. So with the AI coming and, uh, coming and the digital revolution changing all of our lives, what we need to think about is all of the algorithms that we are making, how can we use them to solve some of the uh, very pressing problems that we have today? And one of the biggest problems we have is actually climate change. And this is a picture of the Athabasca oil sands um, that you can see. And people have given us this imagination of some of the ways we can solve this problem. This is Greta Thunberg. Uh, uh, at the time, she was 15 or 16 years old and gave us like, you know, the imagination that even the smallest, youngest of us can do something to uh, battle the climate change. So. What can we do as um, using machine learning and EDA algorithms to, to do so, solve some of these problems? We can use the same techniques we use to predict uh, short, uh, uh, shorts in the circuit or uh, where there are gonna be problems in a circuit to actually make our city safer. So this is on the left is a picture of city of Calgary and where the most amount of um, accidents, crashes or uh, sort of, uh, smaller crimes happen, and we can see that we can actually predict some of the problems that is going to happen to the city based on the city's infrastructure. So how congested a road is going to be, or how uh, how many uh, parks and trees are in a city, and like you know how where people can actually have some um, ways of uh, communicating with another and making a community can actually make the city better. The other problem is uh, we, I had worked on clock networks and buffer sizing, and we can actually use some of the techniques used there in reducing the power set used to send the crude oil in the pipelines, and that will save a lot of the greenhouse gases as well. And then finally, we can use reinforcement learning to make new public and private systems for autonomous vehicles that are going to be uh, prevalent in our cities. And so these uh, transportations can make sure that people stay connected while we are reducing our uh, greenhouse gases. So, and finally, I can say that um, we haven't got to the place where our machines have got imagination, but what we have to ask ourselves is, can we have actually this EDA algorithms that uh, that it would be upon us to make the EDA algorithms to make associations between different problems that we are seeing and then be able to solve those problems. And finally, Alan Turing said we can only see a short distance ahead, but we can see plenty that there needs to be done. And uh, these are some of the things that, uh, that the UN has said uh, that are sustainable goals that needs to be done. And so uh, my call to this group is to whenever we are making something for an EDA algorithm to think about, is it possible to solve some of these problems? And finally, I want to leave you with some pictures of Alberta. This is sort of Lake Louise uh, in the summertime. And this is the Sunshine Ski Village before COVID, but it's just still open. So hopefully next year we can have this forum in uh, Alberta. Professor at com of Computing Science at the University of Alberta and a fellow and fellow in residence at Alberta Machine Intelligence Institute. He is the director of the Intelligent Robot Learning Lab and a principal investigator in the Reinforcement Learning and Artificial Intelligence Lab, both at the University of Alberta. Matt was formerly a principal researcher at Borealis AI in Edmonton, the uh, AI research lab for the Royal Bank of Canada. His current research interests include fundamental improvements to reinforcement learning, applying reinforcement learning to real world problems and human agent interaction. So go ahead, Matt. Awesome, thanks, Hugh. So I was planning on giving some background on reinforcement learning because I think it's a really exciting and mature technology. And then the last three talks have all talked about reinforcement learning. So that's awesome. Um, so what I think I'd like to do is say, I've got two points for if you already know reinforcement learning, 
then I've got two, mo- two points to make, and then you might want to go grab a coffee. So those two points are first, that um, I, I really like the last slide that, that you had, never send a human to do a machine's job. I think, I think we're all on board that machine learning has to be part of most processes that companies are doing these days. But I would argue that humans and machine intelligence combined can do a better job than either one on their own. So if that's something you're interested in talking about, you're welcome to ask a question or talk about that later. Uh, The other point I wanted to make is I'm coming to talk to you today as a reinforcement learning expert who's really interested in applying RL in other domains. And I would like to encourage you to think about if you are um, working on problems, instead of trying to become a reinforcement learning expert yourself, it might make sense to contact someone like me or somebody else with a deep RL reinforcement learning background so that you don't need to reinvent everything from scratch. Um, so what one of the things I like to do is work in lots of different areas and try to find good places for this reinforcement learning tool that I'm really excited about. So what I'd like to do is spend a few minutes, if you are not really re- uh, familiar with RL, I wanted to just give you a taste for why, how it works and why it's important. But again, I, I know the last three talks I've already mentioned RL. So if you are already familiar with RL, I'm gonna suggest you get a coffee for 10 minutes and then come right back. So with that, I'll launch in and say just three things I'm trying to accomplish in this talk, talk a little bit about RL, give some examples, some of which you've already seen, and then talk about next steps. And you are welcome to interrupt me with voice or video, or I, I will be watching the chat function. So you're welcome to hop in hop in on chat too. So as, as you all probably know, there's three flavors of machine learning, supervised learning, unsupervised learning, where you have data sets. Reinforcement learning is really different because here you have an agent that's interacting over time with the environment. So this agent could be a robot, it could be a program, but in any case, it's in some place, it takes an action, and then over time is trying to get this reward. And in the second part of the talk, I'll give some examples of using RL for optimization of a compiler and go into a little more detail on that Google paper for chip placement. So the the big difference from supervised learning is this agent is never told right or wrong, right? So um, canonical example is game playing. If you're playing a game, you may win, you may lose, but no one ever goes and tells you, oh, you should have gone right here instead of left. Instead, it's up to you to figure out what's the best and you never really know what the best is. So one of the things you have to do is interact with this environment, so in the simulator or the real world, and gather data. And like the last talk was alluding to, gathering this data, doing these interactions with the simulator can be quite computationally intensive. So this can take time, or depending on what you're doing, it can actually have real world costs. So for instance, if you're, do, if you're learning to stock trade stocks in the stock market, then as you're taking these actions, you could be losing money. So that can be pretty dangerous. One of the key challenges is exploring versus exploiting. So if I'm exploiting, that means I'm gonna take what I think is best and keep doing that in order to get more and more reward. But at the same time, I do want to explore. I don't want to assume I know everything. I don't want to assume that I'm doing the best. I wanna keep trying new things. And part of that could be because there could be changes in the environment. So if things are changing over time, then you need to keep exploring. So for instance, if you've optimized a compiler for a particular kind of problem, and now new types of problems or new types of programs are suddenly coming in, maybe you still want to try new things to better optimize those new kinds of programs. So in general, you can think of automation. You know, I've got some, uh, some person who's doing something. I want to automate this. So for instance, ship design or placement. Or instead of just getting rid of a a human, I want to improve on that, improve on the existing either human or programmatic approach. And the third thing is thinking about just enabling completely novel processes. So the idea of chip building chips that could go and design new chips, like that that's a pretty uh, cool AI artificial intelligence uh, type approach. And maybe we'll get there someday, maybe we'll find out that's impossible but that would be the kind of novel process that reinforcement learning might enable. So 
I think um, I, I was talking to a bunch of uh, recent business business school grads, and they basically all agreed that yes, when you're starting a new company, you need to be thinking about um, machine intelligence, need to be thinking about machine learning. And a lot of that is we know supervised learning works so well. There have been some big successes in reinforcement learning. One of the big ones is um, AlphaGo, where we, uh, reinforcement learning beat a world-class Go player. But a lot of these are in games. However, there are lots of places where reinforcement learning has succeeded. So there's a recent example of reinforcement learning being used for stock trading. Um, I've done a little bit of work in energy education. Um, there's a bunch of work in games and I've done some work in robotics. And this is really thinking about how we can optimize RL for computer systems because if there is a sequential decision process, which I'll give a few examples of, then reinforcement learning should be a tool you can use. So if you can find a place to use reinforcement learning, you absolutely should. Because my claim is that it is a mature technology, it's ready to get out of video games and is having successes in real world applications. So some of the goals for RL is, well, we wanna learn quickly. So for instance, here, if we just have a little bit of data and maybe we wanna learn very fast, or maybe we wanna maximize the final performance, or maybe we wanna do something that combines both of best worlds. But the idea overall is we're gonna reduce human effort because the machine is learning for us. We're not hand coding things. Hopefully we'll discover novel solutions. We better be able to outperform whatever a human can do. And like I mentioned before, you can handle non-stationarity. So as a really simple toy example, let me give you this Wally setting where you have 12 states, you can move in four directions. Those, those, so those four directions are the actions. The transition function describes how you can move. So you can't go through, can't go through the wall and you've got a small chance of slipping to the side. So if Wally tries to go up, if he tries to go up, there's a small chance he'll slip to the side. And then there's some reward function. So for instance, you got a plus one or a minus one towards the end, and then you learn how to act. So there also could be some step penalty. So if you have a, a reasonable step penalty, then Wally basically does what you'd expect him to do. He goes and goes up to that plus one. But if the step penalty is particularly low, then he does some counterintuitive things. So in this state, the optimal thing is to run yourself into the wall. Because if you try to go up in this state, there's a small chance you'll slide into the negative one. So instead, while he's better off just ramming himself into that wall until eventually he slips to the side and then either goes around the long way or goes directly to the goal. Similarly, if the reward is very um, bad at every step, then Wally just wants to end things as fast as possible. He just wants to finish the, the, the problem. So I'm emphasizing this because your RL algorithm is going to optimize whatever you tell it to, whether that's actually what you want or not. So later when we talk about the uh, Google work, I'll mention the reward that they chose and why that may or may not be appropriate. So, okay, some examples. So the first one is um, for those of you who haven't played it, back in 2003, someone, a uh, guy from Vietnam released Flappy Bird. It was developed over a few days, um, supposedly two or three days. And then the next year he took it off the market because he said it was too addictive, even though he was supposedly making $50,000 a day. So here you see Flappy Bird um, and it's doing very poorly. So this is normal for reinforcement learning. It is consistently running into the ground and running into the pipes. But then after, let's say after two hours of training, now it's achieved superhuman performance. So that's the kind of setup we want to identify. Now, one of the nice things about Flappy Bird is, okay, transition function, that's just the game. The action is actually tap on the screen. So Flappy Bird, there's only one action. Do I flap or not flap? The reward can just be the number of pipes I pass. And one thing I wanted to emphasize here is, um, the, especially the last talk, you was talking about deep learning. A deep learning approach to this game could be to learn just over pixels. And that would take days, most likely. It would take days to learn a good representation to figure out how to act over pixels. However, if you tell Flappy Bird the distance to the next pipe 
and the distance from me to the top of the next pipe. With those two numbers, Flappy Bird can act optimally. So this is a point where you don't need a convolutional neural network. If you can figure out exactly what features go into your agent, you should use those. You don't need to do something, some fancy representation learning. And that's, I wanna take that and transition to example number two. So this is something we did about 12 years ago. So in the mid 2000s at University of Texas, Austin, they had the TRIPS project. Um, Catherine McKinley and Doug Berger were running that. And it was this, this new fancy chip. And they, they had a basic scheduler, but it was very heuristic. So they had the data flow graph, and then they had to figure out how to get the different instructions and have the scheduler place those onto different computational units. So it was a pretty hard scheduling problem because at, at any point there's 120, up to 128 instructions. So there's 128 factorial schedules. So what we did is we used um, some techniques to identify 11 features. So based on the instructions we had already placed and the instructions that were still left, then we would figure out which instruct, then the state was basically, um, what do I have left and what's already been placed? And then the action would be to grab one of those instructions that are left and stick it into one of the computational units. And then the reward on every step was zero until the end when we ran all 128 of these instructions and found what the speed up was. So in this particular case, we, we optimized 47 benchmarks and we found that using an evolutionary algorithm or genetic algorithm, we were able to make uh, pretty large improvements if we, uh, if we specialized per benchmark. It's not too surprising. We didn't do nearly as well if we wanted to come up with just a general scheduler. And then an intermediate result was clustering. So trying to find benchmarks that were similar, cluster those together, and then optimize per cluster. So this was just an, an example of using reinforcement learning you know, 12 years ago for how we could optimize a compiler. Then more recently, like we just heard about in the last talk, Google has this, what I think was pretty cool work on, ch on chip placement. So if you're interested, you can find out more in archive, but they showed this for both TPUs and ASIC, application specific integrated circuits. So what they would do is they've got these kind of three embeddings and then they concatenate those, stick it into a feed forward neural network. And then the output of this neural network are for, for the current thing I'm trying to place, all the possible places I could put it, all the possible grid cells. So this agent is going to place one of these macros at a time and then they use this uh, force directed method, which apparently started in uh, the early seventies to place the more standard cells. So they're figuring out where to place these macros and then they run it. And there's a few things. So state, all the places I could um, place things based on the net, on the net list. Um, actions are place a current macro at some location as long as it doesn't violate any constraints. So that's an example of injecting human knowledge. And then they've got a reward. Again, similar to our work, it's zero everywhere except for the last action. And the real world reward, let's see, I wanna get the wording right. So the real reward is based on um, commercial EDA tool that includes wire length, routing congestion, density, power, timing, and area. What they did for training is use an approximate reward, just something based on wire length and congestion. Because if this thing is going to take days to train, if in this inner loop, you're making a, a difficult comp computation to figure out reward, you really wanna make that faster. So they have this, one of the graphs where they have, they can show that the, uh, it improves over time. In this case, they were able to use transfer learning to speed things up. And you've got a nice animation in the lower left where um, if it starts over, you'll see that on the right is the, version that uses transfer and the left is learning from scratch. Let me see if I can get this GIF to restart. No, I'm not gonna be that lucky. Okay, oh, there it goes. So you can see on the left, initial training, if you're learning from scratch is not very good, but on the right, if you're using transfer, it works better. Um, and just the final thing I'll mention really quick 
is another cool project that uh, Amy, the Alberta Machine Intelligence Institute is doing, is doing water treatment. One of the reasons I really love that is not only are we getting fiscal benefits from that, but we're also, get, also getting environmental benefits. So you can always think of reinforce, always, you can often think of reinforcement learning fitting into a multi-objective context where you're thinking about there are multiple things I want to trade off. And a few talks ago, so um, shoot, I can't remember his name, um, but he was talking about, I believe it's from Waterloo. Um, he was talking about the Pareto optimal for finding different neural network architectures. Similarly, you could find Pareto optimal um, policies and figuring out how you want to weight different uh, uh, goals or objectives against each other. All right, so that was my whirlwind um, tour of reinforcement learning. You should really learn more about it. But just a f I wanted to end with a few um, kind of pros and cons of reinforcement learning. So reinforcement learning is great because you can autonomously learn to maximize rewards. The programmer specifies the goals. You should save a lot of time Right? It shouldn't take you weeks to do this chip placement task. It should be a matter of hours. And you better be able to outperform humans or you're doing something wrong. I will mention though, that like I said earlier, this agent's going to maximize the reward. So if you specify a reward that's not exactly right, you could get counterintuitive behavior. So for instance, if you're expecting an agent to complete a level in a game and you give it reward based on points, the agent may get in a reward cycle where it just keeps doing the same thing to get more and more points. Similarly, it can take a lot of computation. So I mentioned, uh, or I flashed up a picture of OpenAI and Dota 5. So that was a, um, a team game where they are able to outperform one of the best teams in the world. And that was really, it was a really impressive achievement, but they were using something like 130 years of simulated compute every day for training. So that's not something that most of us can afford to do unless you're someone like Microsoft or Google. So a lot of my research and a lot of people who work in reinforcement learning is figuring out how to um, learn faster and in my case, how to incorporate knowledge, whether that's from existing problem programs or from humans. Another problem is that the solutions are often black box. So there's often an additional step, which can be difficult to, once you've trained an agent, try to figure out what the heck it's doing. That can be hard. And like I mentioned before, the initial performance can be poor. So with that, I just wanna point out that if this seems like something you're, uh, if this seems like reinforcement learning could be a good tool, there's a bunch of free resources online. There are classes that talk about normal reinforcement learning. Um, there are textbooks that I think are particularly good. Or if you wanted to jump straight into deep reinforcement learning, that's possible too. And, oh, okay, so, and, and Peter asked, what's wrong with Google's reward criteria? So I'm not sure, um, I think uh, you were saying earlier that there was uh, something that he didn't really like. I didn't really catch if that was with the reward criteria. The thing that they're doing though, is they are um, just approximating it. So it's entirely possible that what they're approximating is not the, the best thing. Um, so I did not, in their paper, I did not see a study of whether their proxy reward was well aligned with the real reward they cared about or what would happen to the performance if they use the real reward, which they acknowledge is much slower. And what could be, how could it be improved? Um, so one of the things you mentioned is they could run for longer, have better baselines. Uh, one of the things I liked is that Google was using PPO, which is one of the state-of-the-art reinforcement learning algorithms but they could always try other RL methods like evolutionary approaches. And there's always things that you can do to make, um, if you take away constraints, learning will take longer, but it's possible you can achieve better performance. So it's possible that there are some ways that you could take away constraints and let reinforcement learning try to find better solutions. Okay, so with that, um, I'll just say, if you want to take a screenshot, I think these slides will be available later. Here's, here's links to a bunch of resources. Also, I'm excited about talking with all of you because my goal is to bring reinforcement learning out of the lab and into real world situations. 
And you all are, are as we heard, heard from the last three talks, are already using reinforcement learning. But if you think I could be useful to your research going forward, feel free to drop me a line. Here's my, my group's website. And also, Amy does work directly with companies. So if you are interested in trying to um, upskill your employees or take a uh, machine learning management class where you wanted to learn how more how to manage reinforcement learning projects, I'd be very interested in talking about that with you. They also do advanced research. So I think we've got about two minutes left for questions. Thanks for asking some in the chat, but I'd be happy, if, if we have time, I'd be happy to take some more. Okay, thanks a lot, Matt. All right, thanks everyone. Uh, so it, we'll move to the next uh, presentation from Dr. Shaki Uribe from uh, University of Guelph. Uh, Shaki received a BSc in computer engineering from Tripoli University, Libya in, in 1984, MASc and PhD degrees from University of Waterloo in 1991 and 95 respectively. Uh, he was a faculty member uh, at the uh, EC department at Ryerson Polytechnic University from 1997 to 99, and currently is a professor at University of Guelph in the School of Engineering and Computer Engineering program. <coughs> Research interests include VLSI physical design automation, combinatorial optimization, machine learning, reconfigurable computing, si computing systems, embedded systems, and parallel processing. He's a registered professional engineer in Ontario and a senior IEEE member. He has, co he has authored or co-authored over 120 papers in international journals and conferences. He served on the technical program committees for several international conferences in, in computer engineering and embedded systems. He's also served as a member of the program committee for GECCO, HPC, and several other IEEE conferences. Okay, thanks, Shaki. Thank you, uh, you for the introduction and thanks for the invitation to the CMC workshop. So in this short talk, I'll cover some of the research work we developed at the University of Guelph that involves integrating machine learning and deep learning within the FPGA placement and highlight the benefits we achieved. Can you see the, my screen at this point, Hugh? Yes, I can, thanks. Okay. So um, uh, in the past two to three decades, the FPGA CAD community relied heavily on optimization algorithms and meta heuristics to solve empty hard problems within the EDA flow. In fact, the majority of the EDA tools were algorithmic driven. However, as technology nodes tend to shrink and application get more complex, several problems started to appear and alternative solutions were needed. So, um, the main limitation of current algorithmic based uh, EDA CAD flows um, are that some problems are too complex for handwritten rules. Uh, the rules of a task are constantly changing. The nature of the data itself keeps changing. There are many benefits of using machine learning for CAD. It's data driven, no explicit programming, provides guidance to the flow. So machine learning for CAD seems like a perfect match. Machine learning can be used in different phases and stages of the FPGA CAD flow. So in this talk, I'll focus on a single stage of the flow, that is the circuit placement. Machine learning can be used to solve several challenging problems within the placement flow, including congestion estimation, congestion forecasting, congestion management, probability prediction, timing estimation, and many, many more. We will start with a brief introduction to the FPGA placement and the tools we used in developing the machine learning plugins. So given a circuit described in the form of a netlist and a description of the target FPGA architecture, the goal of the FPGA placement is to map the components present in the netlist onto unique locations on the fabric of the FPGA. So this mapping is done in such a way that one or perhaps more objectives are optimized like wire length or critical path delay. Though congestion is becoming an increasingly important objective as too much congestion in the placement may prevent the router from even finding a feasible solution. Simulated annealing was used extensively in the past to solve the FPGA placement problem. However, it did not scale well with large designs. Therefore, analytic placement techniques replaced these meta heuristics since they provide excellent solutions in a reasonable amount of time. Uh, most of uh, the machine learning frameworks that we have developed uh, at the University of Guelph were integrated within our FPGA placement tool, GPlace. So GPlace consists of three main phases, a wireland driven global placement phase, a congestion driven placement phase, and finally detailed placement. 
uh, GPlace targets the Xilinx ultrascale architecture, and we're modifying it to target other architectures, including the Xilinx ultrascale plus. Um, we will first introduce the different machine learning frameworks that we have developed for congestion estimation within the FPGA placement phase. And the first work is based on our 2018 FDL paper that received the Michael Servet Award. We coined the approach ML Conj. Since congestion is one of the main barriers and obstacles for routing designs, the ability to quickly and accurately estimate congestion is becoming a very critical task and it needs to be addressed during placement. So congestion occurs when the demand for routing resources exceeds the supply in some regions of the design. In this example, we have two channels available. However, three connections are required. And therefore, this type of congestion may lead to unroutable solutions. If the congestion is not managed properly, it may lead to suboptimal solution in terms of wire length, routability, and timing closure. The proposed framework uh, employs supervised uh, based uh, algorithms. Therefore, these algorithms require training data to learn the relationship that exists between the model input and its predicted output. Uh, four features are calculated for each G cell of the FPGA, and each feature is designed to capture probability information. And the first feature is the wire length per area which estimates the routing demand of each net by estimating the wire length of the net. The uh, uh, second uh, feature uh, is the number of pins within a G cell, which is used to model the congestion of the G cell. And then the third and fourth features are the nets cut per region, where a large number of cut nets indicate a high demand on the inter-region global routing resources. Now, as we all know, machine learning and deep learning algorithms typically require a large data set for training and testing. So with this in mind, we utilize 12 ISPD 2016 routing aware placement context circuits. And we also use 372 benchmarks synthesized by Xilinx. The overall ML framework consists of two stages, an offline training and testing stage and an online deployment stage. In the training stage, the benchmarks are placed by GPlace and the corresponding congestion features are extracted along with the actual congestion label provided by the Xilinx detailed router. And pre-processing is performed by filtering records corresponding to unused regions and a machine learning algorithm is trained with these records. In the testing stage, we evaluate the performance of the ML framework on unseen data and find uh, tune its parameters. And of course, the final tuned ML model is deployed by integrating it within GPlace. Um, our machine learning congestion estimation model, ML Cond, was compared with several congestion estimation techniques, including the global router, and achieved the best performance based on several metrics. <clears throat> um, ML Cond was also contrasted with. Uh, these methods in terms of quality of congestion heat map produced, and it closely resembled the heat maps produced by the Vivaldo detailed router. Um, a comparison with other states uh, of the art machine learning based approaches uh, indicated that machine uh, or ML conj was more accurate and superior by almost 25%. We also compared a global router with the uh, ML conj in terms of quality of solutions like wire length and runtime. And on average, ML conj was almost 300 times faster. Our next work is based on the group's recent FPL 2020 paper and builds upon our previous work in FPL 2018. It is coined DL conj since it is based on a deep learning approach. So, um, in this work, we claim that the performance of our previous work and our crunch can be improved by using a deep learning technique, uh, specifically a convolution encoder decoder that we uh, that is called DL crunch. It is capable of capturing global behavior rather than the local behavior, and it's also capable of modeling the nonlinear relationship between the FPGA resources and uh, and the placement. 
The DIACONJ achieves a prediction accuracy of almost 94%, which is an improvement of 9% over the, our previous work and our punch. And it scales well, and its inference time is a few milliseconds. Um, the data is generated by extracting feature maps from placements along with Vivado heat maps. And these are used for training, validation, and testing. The uh, convolution encoder decoder consists of five layers in the encoder and decoder portion. And the input to the set or the, the feature maps and the output of the set is the estimated congestion. The convolution layers capture the spatial relations of a switch with the surrounding switches. And every encoder layer is connected to its corresponding decoder layer using skip connection. These are responsible for passing the local congestion information. The proposed deep learning technique, uh, DLCONJ, was compared with several congestion estimation techniques, including MLCONJ, using both structured and unstructured metrics. DLCONJ improves upon MLCONJ on all metrics used. The unstructured metrics are considered to be like fine grain level, while the structured metrics are for grain level. Uh, DLCONJ was tested on placement solutions produced by other state-of-the-art academic tools and even Vivado. And the results indicate that the also can generalize to other places of congestion with an accuracy of up to 91%. Um, next, we introduce a framework that is capable of predicting the routability of a placement with high accuracy. Uh, this work is based on our 2019 FDL paper that received the best paper award. So placements can be classified as either routable or unroutable, depending on the amount of congestion present. And the ability to accurately and efficiently estimate the routability of the circuit algorithmically is challenging and difficult. And that's why in this work, we present a novel deep learning framework based on convolution neural networks, CNNs, to accurately predict the routability of a placement. And integrating such a predictor in an FPGA placement can assist in improving the quality of the results and the CPU. So the ability to accurately predict the routability of a placement solution ahead of time has positive impact on different phases of the placements. As you recall, GPlace had three different phases. Phase one is the global, placement or wireland driven global placements. And the second phase is the congestion driven global placement. And the third is the retail placement. And the early estimate of the routability can help the placer uh, to avoid pursuing dead end paths and enables the placer also to improve its optim optimization strategy. Um, congestion maps produced by the MLCONJ or DLCONJ, the two techniques that I just mentioned, can be used as input to DLROUTE. And DLROUTE uses these congestion heat maps to predict the routability of the placements. The uh, CNN architecture consists of several convolution layers and max pooling layers. The network takes a congestion heat map as input. And then the convolution layers are used to extract the features. And two fully connected layers at the end are used to classify the flattened vector of features. And a sigmoid output neuron generates the binary label at the end. Uh, during the training phase, 70% of the heat maps generated from the placement, along with the labels generated by the Vivado router, are used to build the CNN model. And The model is then tested on 30% of the remaining data to quantify the accuracy of the model. And the best CNN model is then used during the deployment phase. Um, the deep learning model was able to achieve a high accuracy of almost 97% with an inference of a few milliseconds. And when we tested it on each placement phase within GPlace, the DLROG framework maintained its accuracy. The proposed routability predictor was uh, tested on Xilinx Vivado placer, plus some state-of-the-art academic placer like QT Place and Ripple FPGA. 
and every placer was used to generate placements for the benchmarks that we have collected. And every placer had a success failure rate throughout these benchmarks. And these placers could have avoided performing routing if the DL route were used. The saving in terms of time ranges between 40% to 80%. Next, we show how the previous ML frameworks are combined and utilized to create an adaptive smart flow. So this work is based on our paper in the 2020 ML CAD workshop held in November. In this work, we propose a deep learning framework to accurately forecast the congestion that will be present in the future based on congested features obtained during the early phases of the placements. This framework is then integrated within GPlace to make smart decisions that enable it to reduce the CPU time while maintaining the quality of the results achieved. The overall deep learning approach proposed in this work is intended to be integrated within GPlace to create a smart and adaptive flow. So DL forecast is used to accurately predict the congestion that could be present at the later placement iterations. And the results are then fed back to the placer and it's also forwarded to the DL route to obtain probability of achieving a routing solution. The controller within GPlace then makes a decision between several alternative courses of action. The input to the model is a set of concatenated placement feature maps, along with the ground truth feature used as a label. And the model is used to forecast the congestion feature maps of future iterations. And once trained, it's deployed and integrated within the placement tool. The input of the network is the current placement feature maps. The output of the network is the predicted congestion at later iterations. We employ two most commonly used metrics for quantifying prediction accuracy, including MAE and the coefficient of determinations. The results obtained indicate that the DL forecast can indeed predict congestion at later iteration with accuracy of almost 94%. To show the effectiveness of the DL forecast as a plugin within the GPlace, we compare the runtime and solution quality, i.e. wire length of GPlace with and without DL forecast. So column two and three compare the runtimes of GPlace with that of DL forecast respectively. And column four shows that GPlace with DL forecast achieves runtime improvements on average around 40%. Column five shows a percentage increase and decrease in wire length of GPlace. It's clear that no significant deterioration in quality of results occur as we use DL forecast. So in conclusion, we can say that algorithmic CAT based on analytic solutions need human guidance Algorithmic driven CAD is slow, it's costly, but it's accurate. And data driven ML CAD can aid designers with fast quality of result evaluation and guide algorithmic CAD with optimal inputs. And the data driven CAD is fast, it's cheap, and accurate. Machine learning can also be used in several other directions, including adaptive hyperparameter tuning, guidance to designer to choose best options and enhance the productivity of optimization techniques. Thank you. This is our website and we are currently adding qualified graduate students to our team. So contact us if interested. Great, thanks Shakit. Uh, I guess we'll um, go to the, the final presentation of for the day, uh, and that's from uh, Dr. Yuri Grinberg from the National Research Council Canada. He's an associate research officer uh, within the Digital Technologies Research Center at NRC. He obtained his PhD in computer science from McGill University in 2014 and was an NSERC postdoctoral fellow in Ottawa Hospital Research Institute before joining NRC. His expertise is applied and Theoretical Machine Learning and Reinforcement Learning. He has co-authored over 25 peer-reviewed publications, 
In the past several years, he has been co-leading the, the development of AI techniques for the design of photonic components. Uh, currently, he is leading an AI-assisted photonics design master project within the NRC-wide AI for Design Challenge program. So, take it away, Yuri. Hello, everybody. So, uh, can you hear me well? Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for the introduction. So uh, my talk today uh, will be a little bit different in the sense that it's not as much focused on the uh, electronic design automation or circuit design, but rather uh, the design of some of the components within the circuit, which is uh, there are a lot of challenges when it comes to uh, silicon photonics nowadays. Uh, but ultimately, uh, um, some of the lessons that learned in this process, I believe, could be applied to circuit design in certain uh, circumstances. So first of all, I would like to uh, acknowledge uh, everybody who contributed to the work that I'm going to cover here. So there are a few uh, pictures to the right. These are uh, my close uh, colleagues in the NRC who uh, did the um, heavy lifting. Uh, and then we have at the NRC a larger group of people uh, who contributed in different ways. And also um, we have our collaborators at the University of Malaga uh, in Spain, um, and as well uh, a, a few people from ANSYS Lumerical uh, helped us out. So um, I am going to outline uh, some of the challenges of uh, what I call high dimensional design in nanophotonics. And after that, I will highlight how uh, specifically the tools in the dimensionality reduction realm, which is part of machine learning pattern recognition package, uh, can uh, help us out to solve those problems. And there will be a couple of case studies that I'm going to uh, uh, demonstrate. Um, I will talk uh, about them uh, in a varying de degree of uh, detail, level of detail, just due to the uh, limits of time that we have here. So uh, let me start by uh, just giving an example of two uh, simple uh, uh, integrated silicon photonic components. So on the left left hand side, uh, by the way, uh, a, a quick question, can you see my cursor? Yes. Okay, excellent. So on the left hand side, uh, there's an example of the design that can serve as a power splitter. So uh, this is the input port for the uh, um, optical wave coming in. And uh, uh, in this context, we would like to split the amount of power into those two output ports equally. Another example on the right hand side is the so-called grating coupler when the light coming in in this uh, thickness and in, in, in this silicon layer. And then due to the uh, shape of the grating here, the teeth and trenches, it, go, uh, it will be emitted uh, upwards. Uh, and for example, it will be collected by a fiber. Yeah. So uh, traditionally the design of uh, those integrated silicon components have been heavily uh, guided by physics, which means uh, it relies a lot of analytical or semi-analytical models of how a uh, wave, uh, uh, light wave behaves uh, in different uh, materials. Uh, but this also means that uh, there's uh, pretty severe limitations to what kind of structures will be considered in those designs. So for example, the structures will really be simple. So this is like a rectangle here. And then you control maybe the width uh, um, and the placement of uh, the ports, uh, the size of the rectangle. And on the right hand side, uh, you might control uh, the uh, uh, sort of the spacing between the teeth and the thickness of the teeth and maybe the thickness of the layers. Uh, so in the end of the day, uh, uh, following the uh, heavy guidance by uh, physics, uh, analytical or semi-analytical models, the uh, design space is uh, going to be very constrained. There will be just a few free parameters to play with, at which point uh, the designer uh, simulates uh, all those combinations using basically a computer, simulating the behavior of light with those all uh, um, combinations of parameters. So uh, in other words, doing brute force parameter sweep. Um, and the advantage of the brute force parameter sweep in the, is that you can get performance trends and trade-offs for different figures of merits. 
you can um, learn about the limitations of the design space that uh, um, you know, basically you came up with. And also as a result of those, uh, of this kind of uh, pretty interesting picture about the design space, you can come up, the designer might come up with uh, difficult physical insights and uh, some ideas. So nowadays, um, we want to miniaturize uh, photonic components or, and we want to come up with components that exhibit uh, more complex optical behavior. And granted, uh, when going this route, uh, it's becoming more and more difficult uh, to come up with analytical or semi-analytical models that will uh, relate the uh, physical parameters of the design uh, to uh, uh, sort of the different figures of merit and different behaviors of light um, in a very sort of convenient way. And so there has been a trend to essentially uh, uh, ask the computer to come up with uh, useful structures instead of uh, basically human coming up with uh, certain structured designs. However, at the expense of increasing the uh, design space by increasing the number of parameters in the problem. So on the left-hand side, uh, you can see an example of uh, uh, an idea of coming up with a much smaller power splitter. Uh, and hopefully you can actually uh, come up with this design by uh, uh, playing with uh, sort of the, uh, the edges of the power splitter and not making it rectangular anymore. And uh, there are actually results on that. And on the right hand side, this is an example of a more complex uh, a grating coupler that I will come uh, uh, back to in a few slides ahead. Um, so it's a more complex behavior. And uh, so there is less guidance by physics. Uh, the uh, design space is larger. Uh, and that uh, also automatically means that the parameter sweep becomes invisible. Uh, and that's uh, obviously a kind of almost trivial observation because uh, the number of designs that you need to evaluate is, uh, um, if you're considering brute force parameter sweep, is going to um, grow exponentially as the number of uh, free parameters in the system. So, uh, however, like while parameter sweep is invisible, so uh, instead of the parameter sweep, people have been doing different kinds of optimization and uh, using those optimization methods to uh, arrive at an optimized solutions. And so uh, while using the optimization and uh, using those kinds of setup uh, have moved the state of the art, uh, have shifted the state of the art significantly and there are very interesting results and promising results. Uh, really there is a limitation to uh, what you can learn from uh, one or a handful of optimized solutions. Uh, it's much harder, for example, to anticipate what the performance trends or trade-offs between different figures of merit, different uh, aspects of the uh, design uh, that you care about, what those uh, trade-offs will be, what are the limits of the design space, uh, or uh, even thinking about what kind of physical insights can you, come, uh, can you learn from just observing a couple of optimized solutions. So uh, I guess before I go, and, and so uh, these are the questions that we were interested in uh, exploring and trying to uh, find the solution of how we can reclaim uh, the benefits uh, that can be, uh, that are obtained by parameter sweep in the lower dimensional say, uh, setting and getting it up to a higher, higher dimensional setting. Uh, and, and just to, uh, highlight or um, just to mention what high dimensional setting uh, means in this context. So for me, really the number of dimensions, uh, the absolute value of number of dimensions, it, it really doesn't, it, it's not important. What is important though, is that uh, as long as uh, the uh, brute force parameter sweep isn't feasible, uh, I would call it a higher dimensional setting for the purpose of uh, these kind of problems. So um, uh, taking uh, this, uh, considering this problem in mind, uh, last year uh, we uh, came up with the uh, new design framework 
that tries to address uh, those uh, concerns that we would somehow like to reclaim the benefits of parameter sweep in the higher dimensional setting. And this is, uh, this is working in three stages. So we call this uh, new design approach global mapping. So global mapping using, using dimensionality reduction. And the three stages start from uh, uh, collecting a uh, initial set of interesting designs. So what does that mean? Uh, for example, there might be many uh, elements of the designs that you care about. And let's say you pick one of the figures of merits that is important in your problem. And so you're going to run uh, some kind of an optimizer uh, uh, in the high dimensional design space that is going to optimize and arrive at an individual or a handful of solutions. And this optimizer might be repeated several times from different initial starting points so that after some number of runs, you do obtain uh, this seed collection of what, what I would call interesting designs. And at this, uh, once this step is done, then we're mov moving to the second and the key step which is applying dimensionality reduction just to the collection of interesting designs obtained. And ultimately, at this step, uh, the dimensionality reduction tool is going to reveal uh, the uh, sort of true uh, dependence between parameters, uh, hopefully global dependence, and, and true little, uh, dimensionality of uh, the, only the subspace that you care about within the higher dimensional space. And uh, of course, depending on the problem, uh, uh, this can be low dimensional enough or not. Uh, but if uh, sort of uh, in, in cases that we have been working with um, the results uh, that we get, uh, we get fairly low dimensional design subspaces that actually allow us to move to the uh, step three, which is uh, an exhaustive coverage of this uh, lower dimensional design space which will be really akin to a parameter sweep. So this way uh, uh, we are kind of reclaiming the uh, benefits of the parameter sweep in this uh, higher dimensional setting. For the first use case, uh, I will bring back the uh, uh, um, structure that rep represents the perfectly vertical grading coupler that I briefly uh, mentioned early in the slides. This is a five-dimensional parameter space. Um, essentially, uh, the, it is defined by five uh, section lengths here. And those lengths of uh, different materials, I think blue is silicon and white is silicon oxide, they are sort of repeated in, in a particular pattern. So this design uh, space, as well as one single optimized solution uh, were reported a few years ago. And we took this as a, an interesting test bed to see how well our um, global mapping framework uh, works out there. So we set up uh, an optimization um, scheme uh, where basically we're optimizing uh, um, starting from different initial uh, conditions, different random initialization of those length. Uh, and we're optimizing for one of the main triggers of merit, which is called coupling efficiency. And by running it uh, several times, we did notice that we are obtaining uh, uh, quite a few, uh, quite different optimized designs. All of them uh, are uh, uh, fairly optimized. So they will be in the top range of uh, coupling efficiency that is possible in that design space. Uh, and so once we obtained uh, some number of those, um, I guess we had like 20 or 30, uh, we didn't need to have that many, uh, but that was an initial experiment. Uh, we moved to the dimensionality reduction stage. And uh, for those of you uh, who are familiar with some of the classical dimensionality reduction methods, uh, the first and simplest thing to try would be linear dimensionality reduction. Or uh, in other words, uh, the so-called uh, principal component com uh, analysis, uh, in short, PCA. So we applied uh, PCA, and it turned out that uh, this is uh, this is a very even this simple method provides a quite impressive reduction. So we were able to reduce the original five-dimensional design space uh, onto sort of a region uh, on the two-dimensional hyperplane. 
that uh, where pretty much all designs lie. Uh, and uh, this is also confirmed by the uh, plot at the bottom right, where uh, the PCA approximation error uh, drops significantly to a fairly small and acceptable numbers where, when we consider just two of the principal uh, linear principal components. And so once we were able to achieve that, uh, now we're dealing uh, uh, with a convenient and comfortable setting of just playing with two parameters. So we can do all kinds of visualizations and investigations of the design space. So here we're plotting the actual coupling efficiency of the entire um, two-dimensional uh, region that we care about, sorry, two-dimensional space. And this is the region that we care about in this two-dimensional design space. For that, we we'll, uh, only needed another uh, 400 data points to simulate. Uh, and this is an interesting comparison um, because if you were to uh, do a brute force parameter sweep in the 5D space, uh, and assuming you know ahead of time the right uh, parameter boundaries, uh, you would need uh, millions of simulation runs. And, and simulations are uh, quite expensive. So uh, in this case, uh, by expensive, I, I mean that it, it takes, let's say a single simulation takes about 30 seconds or so. Uh, so once you have this uh, uh, reduced uh, dimensional space, you can also investigate or confirm um, whether uh, this space indeed is sort of uh, as it appears to be, uh, in our case, whether it's actually somewhat uh, of a 2D plane or not. So we can cut it in different uh, places and then try to simulate those cuts and see uh, what, what the thickness of those cuts are. And indeed, um, what we can see is that the actual design space is a little bit curved, but it's still fairly well approximated. Uh, by kind of uh, in, in this picture would be a one dimensional line. So uh, then uh, again, once we have this uh, lower dimensional space, we can uh, map uh, other performance metrics uh, such as uh, back reflection metric, which is very important. And once you do this exercise, uh, uh, once we did this exercise, we noticed uh, there is a quite big uh, diversity in, in uh, how back reflection behaves in this design space. And so different designs might be useful for uh, different applications. Uh, we could uh, as easily uh, come up with ways to calculate uh, different ways, uh, different fabrication tolerances of uh, all the designs of this 2D space and even do uh, a stochastic analysis that uh, uh, tries to calculate the, tries to predict the yield, assuming that you're going to fabricate uh, those designs um, under, uh, and there are some statistical assumptions behind what kind of uh, fabrication errors are going to happen. So all, all this is again, only possible when we manage to reduce the uh, interesting space of designs to something manageable. Last but not least, uh, we uh, looked at this, uh, we noticed um, in this uh, region of interest that uh, all the designs, uh, they will have uh, the minimum feature size is uh, going to be never more than 88 nanometers. So essentially all the designs in this map will have this 88 nanometer uh, size or less and um, although it is possible to make, it's not really favorable for mass production. Um, and a little further looking at the design space, we notice that the main uh, parameters that are responsible for this bottleneck are the first two parameters, L1 and L2. And this inspired us to come up with a new design structure where we take the, uh, these two segments in L1 and L2, they, we merge them together into one segment and instead, uh, this segment is going to be uh, uh, made as a sort of a, what's called the meta material. So it's a, a material. It's kind of it behaves like a material of an intermediate optical property. Now, this is uh, a technology that uh, uh, is possible 
using uh, the so-called sub-wavelength grating. There is a paper, review paper on that published uh, about two years ago. And that's how the new design space was born. So now we still have a five parameter design space, but now we have four uh, parameters, uh, uh, four lengths and one optical uh, parameter that represents the uh, sort of optical behavior uh, of this segment. And we repeated completely the entire exercises, uh, the entire mapping exercise. Um, which indeed revealed that there is a region in this design space where the critical dimensions are at least 100 nanometers or even more than that if we are willing to sacrifice performance a little bit. Uh, and those, are those dimensions uh, are becoming much more interesting from the mass production perspective. Uh, further on, we did some uh, um, experimentation with other uh, device uh, designs. So this one, the top one is uh, what's called the micro antenna. This one is also based on the grating couple that we have seen before, but now we're dealing with uh, 10 parameters instead of five parameters. So it's a 10 dimensional design space and the dimensionality, linear dimensionality reduction, we were able to reduce it uh, with reasonable approximation to three, uh, to three dimensional space and do uh, an exhaustive mapping. And uh, another one is our favorite uh, um, to kind of nowadays, it's a, almost a toy example uh, of uh, a power splitter design. So this is a 10 dimensional, uh, power splitter setup and using the global mapping we were able to reduce it to uh, four dimensions without uh, losing uh, uh, much of the uh, uh, sort of without approx um, incurring high approximation errors. So 4D is a little bit pushing uh, on the um, ability to do exhaustive search but uh, due to uh, speed depths uh, of the simulation software. So basically simulating this design is even faster than those designs. So it's still, uh, uh, you can still uh, do an exhaustive evaluation of 4D uh, uh, space in, in a reasonable time. So this brings me to the conclusion. Uh, I think there is no doubt right now, uh, and everybody will agree, I suppose that machine learning uh, really is very is a very powerful tool to reveal different patterns in data. And in this work, we uh, were able to reveal uh, patterns that help us to reduce the dimensionality of the actual design problems, which are really difficult and simulations take time. So you cannot uh, run uh, simulations for just millions of rounds uh, and not think about it. So you need to be really careful about uh, what kind of data you are um, collecting. Uh, and so following this dimensionality reduction approach, we're able to efficiently identify and characterize the region of interest. And uh, as I mentioned before, reclaim the benefits of uh, the parameter sweep. Finally, uh, although, um, so the focus of uh, my talk was really uh, the photonic designs, uh, but conceptually there is nothing that prohibits uh, the uh, new design framework for being applied in other areas. And in particular, I believe it can be equally applicable to certain circuit design problems that uh, I believe are also high dimensional in nature. Um, so the code uh, is also available uh, publicly on GitHub. So this is the uh, design framework that I mentioned, as well as a couple of uh, examples. Uh, it has been tested uh, with the LAMOPT package from ANSYS Lumerical. And that would be all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Yuri. I guess we'll uh, head into the, the panel or the open discussion section that'll uh, we'll, we'll still wrap up by, by five o'clock, uh, I think. Um, so I guess that at this uh, point, uh, if anyone has any questions, general questions for, for any of the speakers uh, on the, the research uh, challenges in, in this area, um, we have one question in, in, uh, in the chat that was sent to me. So um, 
is there any potential that the success of AlphaGo, that is self-learning, discovering new tactics, will be repeated for EDA CAD tools uh, that is beyond their conventional roles? Does any, do you have any uh, opinions on that? I could jump in for that one. I mean, sure. as, as, as a biased reinforcement learning person, absolutely. Like that, that's the whole hope of reinforcement learning that you will come up with, with novel solutions that you, you can't get through other, other ways. And that, uh, so in the case of AlphaGo, they found new gameplay strategies that they hadn't thought of before and, they, and, and, and experts actually thought they were pretty good. So that, they, that the human experts could change the way they played based on that. But that is just based on my faith in reinforcement learning, not because of a deep understanding of this particular problem. And, and I would go on to say that that's been true of meta heuristics forever. And machine learning is just a new meta heuristic. And I would actually caution that machine learning is not the end all be all of meta heuristics. Uh, <laughs> um, it's actually probably the most expensive, aside from maybe genetic algorithms, expensive approach to try to apply. So, but it's a great it's a great tool of last resort if you don't have any other idea how to get these insights out. Great. Um, any other questions at the moment? Just jump in, uh, take yourself off mute. Otherwise, I guess, are there so that you, you've identified a, a few areas where uh, machine learning uh, has been used uh, successfully in, in EDA and CAD. Are there uh, areas that it hasn't been exploited yet that you think uh, maybe they're, they're, they're ripe for, for exploitation uh, with, with machine learning? Um, one thing I've given some thought to is for power delivery. Uh, so, Power delivery network modeling is expensive for multiprocessor systems. Um, it's either done with SPICE at, uh, at the low level or with uh, expensive transient analysis and architectural simulation at, at a high level. Uh, but since it's sort of spatial in nature that there's probably some opportunity for using convolutional neural networks or something to try to look at, a, to possibly look at where noise is occurring and make predictions and so on. And I think that any area where you can express a problem to take advantage of the structure of machine learning solutions, there's some opportunity to do that. So things with spatial and temporal relationships are, are interesting ones. Any any other thoughts on that? Uh, what other areas are you talking about, uh, Hugh? I mean, apart from the CAD flow, apart from the EDA flow, or well, I mean, the, you you discussed, uh, I guess, you know, placement and routing algorithms and and, and that, that sort of thing. But our, uh, I mean, that's the core of the EDA. Yeah, yeah, but <laughs> anything from uh, you know compiler synthesis. Um, uh, yeah, we haven't seen synthesis. we haven't seen lots of work in the area of uh, you know uh, uh, synthesis or you know technology dependent or technology independent. Uh, I haven't seen much work in uh, you know using machine learning and deep learning. There's also some areas where. Um, the back end tool needs to send information uh, to the front end tool. There hasn't been much work in that area too, which is very, very important. Um, feedback from the back end tool, even to the high level synthesis. Uh, so these are all areas that needs to be explored, I think, in the future. Right. Any, anything in analog or mixed signal design? Where? There has been some work in analog design. I've seen, uh, you know, some work on analog design, uh, but it's not my area of expertise, so I cannot actually uh, make lots of uh, comments there. Mm -hmm. uh, the majority is uh, supervised learning techniques, reinforcement learning, uh, not too much unsupervised learning involved in uh, in the EDA yet. 
Um, there's lots of opportunities of using unsupervised learning techniques there. Uh, it's been used uh, in uh, different areas in um, vision, uh, very successful. Uh, however, in the EDA area, mainly it's supervised learning and uh, reinforcement learning, regression, classification. Right. I think someone at Concordia was looking at using um, neural networks for analog design, uh, basically hyperparameter op optimization, but I can't remember who. And it was, I think that the challenge is just the number of parameters for even reasonable sized analog circuits, the, the space explodes pretty fast. Well, in, in analog design, actually, you have more like a couple of years ago, symbolic circuit analysis. That was an interesting way to, to couple this type of hyper analysis with a kind of reduced dimensionality space because the symbolic circuit analysis was relying on the fact that you can identify some main parameters and then you get some symbolic transfer functions with those parameters embedded. So it was critical to, to finalize or to identify which parameters in your chain of amplifying stages, for instance, are the one modifying the, the performance in the most critical way. And that, that was the trick. I didn't see too much uh, combining symbolic circuit analysis with uh, machine learning in general. So they are still split in my opinion right now. Sounds like an interesting research direction. <laughs> oh yeah, because basically if you go toward analog design, you can imagine that it will explode in many other directions. I mean, you can have the entire uh, MEMS universe, where you can represent actually different MEMS structures, microfluidics or inertial sensors or anything like that in equivalent networks, in equivalent actually circuit representation, yeah? And all of them will be like mapped to a kind of equivalent analog circuit design problem. And then putting actually and pushing machine learning into that direction would be really will open a completely new perspective on the way you design complex microfluidics chips or complex, I don't know, MEMS arrays of transducers and so on. Great. Um, I guess if there are uh, any questions, uh, I have another one. Um, so um, what are, or the key challenges to, to doing research in this area? Is it, uh, or uh, is it uh, infrastructure, the data sets, um, getting collaborations between sort of the EDA and the, the AI community? Um, what do you think are, are, are some of the main challenges? Um, I can say that, I mean, since we started working on, uh, you know, using machine learning uh, in design exploration and uh, in the EDA flow, uh, one of the biggest challenges is the data sets. So we were fortunate to get, you know, uh, synthesized uh, designs from Xilinx. Uh, without them, I don't think we would have been able to, uh, you know, uh, advance a lot in this area. Another challenge is uh, getting the right expertise uh, of students. I mean, usually when you want to uh, hire graduate students, you'd want to look at students who have, you know, uh, some good background algorithmically in the area of optimization, in the area of, you know, BLSI design, but it's very difficult to find somebody with uh, all of these, uh, you know, um, uh, this knowledge plus uh, machine learning and AI. Uh, also, you know, preparing our students uh, for getting into this area uh, we need to revisit, you know, uh, the uh, courses and the type of uh, uh, training that we have to perform. Uh, it's it's just a huge area uh, where they need to learn about, you know, traditional machine learning and then deep learning and all the bells and whistles that comes with it. So these are just some of the, I think, uh, challenges that uh, I can personally, uh, you know, mention. I would build on that by saying that 
students that are interested in doing this kind of work tend to be either knowledgeable in computer hardware or machine learning, but not both. Having that niche combination is, is, is really quite rare. Um, and another challenge related to what Chucky was saying is training, you, like the, the compute resources needed to do these experiments can be pretty incredible. Uh, and uh, the, the labs, my lab and the labs I work with, we can never seem to have enough servers with GPUs to do all of the experiments that we want to do. I, I Definitely totally compute agree. limited in that respect. I totally agree with Brett. We were fortunate to have uh, Graham Taylor here at the University of Guelph with uh, all his uh, uh, you know, GPUs. And uh, we were able to you know, do lots of our experiments uh, using these GPUs also through SharkNet. But uh, yeah, um, storage is required. You know, uh, lots of facilities are required to perform all of these uh, different uh, training and testing and deployment and then uh, hyperparameter tuning and just takes too much time. There was a question I see uh, in the chat. It said, would there be opportunities to try to expose ML students to BLSI and vice versa? Uh, I agree it would be hard to find grad students with both skin sets. Yeah, it, this is one of the challenges that I just mentioned right now. Um, uh, you know, uh, when you're looking at BLSI students or EDA students, um, some of them are not even convinced that machine learning should be the, the way to, 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 you know, to use. I mean, I had a, a brilliant PhD student, algorithmically, he was so sharp, he did a fantastic job. Then when we, you know, introduced machine learning and uh, techniques for deep learning, he just said, no, 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 algorithmic is the way to go. So, you know, to convert them is, is a challenge uh, in itself. Um, converting, you know, ML students to BLSI is going to be difficult. Uh, I think uh, the other way around is much easier. I don't know whether this actually answers your question or not. Yeah, I think it does. I, but I think there, there could be some kind of sustained effort where we try to uh, get these two communities talking to each other, particularly the students, you know, at the, at the intro master's level and trying to get the, the architecture people to get excited about ML and vice versa. Um, one thing I wanted to mention, though, is you know I've been I've been doing machine learning since 2003, and I only recently came to Canada, and I found Compute Canada to be amazing. Like, yeah, it's, it is hard to get on GPUs, but it's so much better, and I think it's just amazing that we have access to this kind of resource. So I, I'm I'm guess I'm a little surprised uh, that you've been so constrained or, or uh, compute constrained. The the biggest difficulty is when it's like the it's the nine the 80 20 rule or the 90 10 rule you know 80 percent of the compute effort or the 80 percent of the effort is needed just to get your experiments running and that's in competition with other students and once once everything's perfect then sure you can ship it off to compute canada but because it's not interactive um, you, you don't want to invest the time getting it running for the batch system until you know there are no bugs <laughs> so there's there, there's still challenges there uh, one other well, thought i had related to getting the students to or getting hardware people introduced to machine learning is at mcgill there's been so much interest in the master's level um, machine learning courses that we've had to open them up for undergrads and all of our different degree programs to be able to take as a technical elective. And we've actually taken the computer science machine learning course and replicated it in our department just to get another person teaching the class and, and they still, they, they fill up. So student interest, I think is driving a lot of hardware people to um, take a look at machine learning, whether or not that survives when the hype kind of dies down is another question because this is probably the, the hottest moment for machine learning right now right um getting computer scientists with a machine learning background to come and learn about hardware i think is a little bit harder but we're we're doing our best to try to expose computer engineers to as much machine learning as we can i agree um computer scientists who get involved with high level synthesis uh are capable of actually carrying out research in this area. So, you know, the marriage of machine learning, deep learning with 
high level synthesis and all the stuff that can be done with high level synthesis is going to be much easier than going to one level below, which is the RTL or the you know uh, hardware descriptive languages. Uh, so they can do it, but it's not as easy as converting a DLSI or a hardware designer uh, to somebody with uh, both types of expertise. So j just throwing, I wanted to throw a few, uh, maybe like one, one main comment uh, as you were talking. Uh, one of the things that, uh, as myself coming from a computer science machine learning community, um, uh, one of the things that the community can benefit is, is not only the availability of well curated data sets that present a sufficiently interesting problem, you know, just a little bit more than the toy, but maybe not full fledged that involves learning a lot of expertise in the domain. But maybe more than that, uh, it will uh, benefit from having an access to simulators for those problems that are just a little bit above the toy, but not maybe full-fledged, like real full-scale uh, circuit design. And if there is a sufficient, uh, sufficiently easy entry to access those simulators and hook it up uh, with, uh, I don't know, machine learning or reinforcement learning algorithms through AI gym or uh, uh, other methods, uh, then I can imagine uh, many computer science labs jumping on that. Uh, and that's the main reason why, I mean, cats versus dogs is so popular. I mean, it doesn't require anything, right? So, um, yeah. And uh, uh, within NRC, we have uh, uh, other uh, sort of uh, domains where AI is used. So I'm, I'm on the photonic side, but there's material discovery, there's the health informatics, etc. And it's always the same. Uh, I mean, we converge to the, towards this understanding of that if, if somebody is able to generate a good simulator, then uh, the computer science community will get really interested in that. I, I just like to amplify that, that you know, I've, I've been successful in agriculture, in finance, in education, and drug discovery. I am not an expert in any of those, but by partnering with experts, they can explain the details to an ML nerd like me and the more accessible it is, the easier it will be to get more people involved, particularly students. Yeah, I agree, Matt, I agree. If you are very specific in terms of the types of, we're talking about graduate students here mainly. So if we <clears throat> narrow down the type of problem that they are, you know, about to, to solve and they're about to do research on, and the majority of it is going to be machine learning driven, given the problem uh, defined well, I think they can do a good job. But to, you know, to convert, you know, a, a, a computer scientist or a machine learning, uh, you know, uh, scientist into uh, the area of DLSI design, and it's it's not that uh, easy. You need to have all the background to 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 do that. I mean, you know, uh, it's one step after the other to build all this type of expertise. Okay, um, Edmund had a comment uh, in in the chat. Edmund, did you want to expand on on that? Um... Oh, okay. Yeah, is. <laughs> It's just the kind of feedback that I get after being a bit involved in different machine learning programs, most of them dealing with medical imaging, which is another big area, especially in ultrasound or the, the quality of images not re revealing too much. And then you rely on the experience of experts to interpret the data. And I'm not a doctor. Yeah, I'm an engineer. So that's another issue. But the general problem that I see with machine learning, and doesn't matter if it is about neural networks or deep learning procedures with convolutional networks and so on, is the fact that all that entire knowledge is stored in a kind of machine understandable format within the network itself, yeah? So the network learns how to solve the problem and it gives you the, the optimal solution, but is not able actually in the present, at the present technology level, to teach back the humans why those solutions were actually the good one. I mean, to create an engineering intuition that typically guides our design, yeah? So 
to teach us back actually, not to just give us, oh, this is the optimal solution for the parameter for the constraints that you set, but rather why. So to discover and to make sense out of the, the optimization process and the patterns that the, the machine learning has found and to translate them actually in the low dimensional space in which a normal engineer can operate, but based on intuition, that, that is something that is critical. And I have the feeling I, I have been actually in the committee of several students actually defending their PhD or their master thesis on a kind of neural network processing of uh, um, medical images, for instance, yeah. But they didn't get any knowledge by themselves. They were just basically the architect of the neural network. The neural network was saying that, okay, now I get uh, 85 percent uh, accuracy compared to the previous best in the class in the same field that was only 80 percent and this was the thesis actually but that doesn't mean knowledge actually for the student so i have the feeling that this the danger that i see even in the future is that we are trying actually to put the entire responsibility of designing things on the shoulders of a machine and not even understand what they do there but in the end, actually, we just accept blindly the, the solutions that they provide. And I agree that they need actually, they, they could deal with much more complex problems than we can solve. But I still believe that it's essential to preserve that engineering intuition and to develop it somehow. And not to see the students actually saying that, okay, I treat it as a black box and I replace one god by another god, yeah, now. But that's okay. That's my perspective. So, <laughs> no, I think that's great, especially in the context of engineering. I think that that's a, a, a real important thing to keep in mind. Personally, with a background in design automation, I see the value of meta heuristics as teaching us about the steps that tools ought to take in order to achieve optimal designs. So, you do some big open ended search when you don't know how to design a thing and then you try to learn well you know good designs kind of look like this and good design processes kind of look like this because then you can write a faster algorithm meta meta heuristics are slow <laughs> because they're designed to be able to solve anything given infinite time so i think there's definitely a, a, a there's definitely a use to, to to that and trying to figure out how to sort of collect information from the process and then build a better algorithm well, um, there is, th this is, sorry, this is related to a previous presentation that was in the morning session, oh, okay, for, for me it was morning, <laughs> in, the, in the session before, yeah, in the first part actually of presentations, when it was discussed about imagination and creativity that is still lacking in machine learning level, yeah? Well, if you think about an engineer thinking creative and inventing new solution, he doesn't rely at that point on formula so much, but relies on an intuition, on some experience that is melted down into his understanding and try to, and very simplified, but he relies on that intuition for, for trying to find and push actually the creativity limits. And that, that part is not there yet. I mean, that simplification and trying to reduce the complexity of the problem to some intuitive understanding, why does it happen that will guide you actually in the next design process? I didn't see it yet. I, I know that there are people actually promoting and trying to work deeper and deeper. I saw some studies in Stanford about making sense actually of the, let's say, what the machine learning has found, yeah? which is stored essentially in the, in the synapses of the neural network. But then to make sense out of it, that's a totally different dimension uh, of, of the of the research context, yeah. Because you need to structure your solution in order to make that knowledge accessible. If you just use standard convolutional neural networks or feed forward networks, all of the knowledge is just sort of distributed throughout the layers. Um, I have a student working on natural language processing, looking at mixture of expert models. We have different models that are trained to try to solve different kinds of problems that compartmentalizes knowledge about a certain thing in a certain location where you could go and then look at it later, perhaps a little bit more easily. But the whole idea of explainability is, is tough. Um, it, it works because it's a big soup of linear algebra. And so if you want <laughs> to learn something from that, like it, it, it's, it, there's just so much information there. <laughs> Uh, 
I, I guess, have a question. I have a question for you. How can CMC help us here with the, you know? I was going to ask you, how <laughs> can CMC help you? <laughs> I mean, we're, we've, we're an infrastructure provider. We, uh, and so are there, are there, I guess, common elements of infrastructure that could be useful in, in this area, tackling a number of these problems? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, it's very difficult to, you know, uh, for researchers, faculty members, uh, you know, to get uh, designs and benchmarks. So this is just, an industry would not in any way, you know, uh, volunteer to give you any type of designs. I, as I said, we were very fortunate to have uh, those synthesized uh, designs from Xilinx. Um, there was, you know, quite a number, 372. Mm. So maybe, you know, if CMC could help in, in, in that direction, I think that would be great. Um, uh, also in terms of the infrastructure, I mean, uh, it's not only gonna be, G, uh, you know, FPGAs uh, that our students use in their courses. Um, you know, some of us will modify their courses so that machine learning and deep learning would be introduced in reconfigurable computing and uh, uh, advanced computer architecture and electronic design automation. So, you know, having infrastructure in the form of GPUs and storage, I think would help uh, from CMC. So I guess, um, uh... The, we, we have a, a GPU cluster or FPJ GPU cluster on, uh, online um, and, and you know it's, it's got eight nodes with uh, a couple of GPUs in each node or a mixture of GPUs and FPGAs. Is that sufficient I think for, for what you're doing or you need like a whole whack load of uh, GPUs uh, at your disposal? Um, it all depends on the season. I mean, when, when you have a paper uh, due, uh, sometimes you're using the GPUs 24 mm seven. -hmm. And, uh, you know, um, uh, and, and sometimes, you know, it continues for a month and two months, just continuously, just to make sure that you're fine tuning the parameters uh, that you're using, you know, the, uh, the correct machine learning and deep learning approach and uh, so um, it all depends. I mean, uh, the GPUs will definitely be helpful from CMC, of course. I haven't actually approached CMC for that yet, but I should. Mm -hmm. I guess as, as, as Brett mentioned, maybe if you had dedicated access to, to a, a node in the cluster to do some of the fine tuning before you, you farm it out to a, the, you know, a big Compute Canada yeah. installation. Um, that would help, yeah. Yeah, okay. Also, um, you know, Matt mentioned that, you know, he's not an expert in the area of EDA, nor, but he's been doing lots of work with uh, agriculture and, uh, and he's an expert in the area of machine learning and deep learning. So uh, I think this, th this workshop is very, very important to, for networking and understand what others are doing. Uh, it would be a good opportunity for um, uh, researchers working in the area of EDA, whether it was ASIC or FPGA, to connect with uh, researchers such as Matt Taylor or Graham Taylor. Mm -hmm. I think all the guys who are experts in uh, machine le learning have a, a last name of Taylor. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, and, that's, and that's a great point. So like in, in Canada, we've got an annual deep learning reinforcement learning summer school. So if your students are not already attending that, they should. And if there's some equivalent that machine learning students should be attending, then we, then we should try to advertise it to them to learn more about the kinds of questions in this community. Yeah, but it's always restricted. I mean, I had several of my students apply to the school and maybe I had a success of 30, 40%. So maybe we would uh, need more for uh, you know those uh, summer schools uh, for our students. Yeah. So when when I ran it, I think we had three hundred acceptances for something like a thousand applications. But everything is online. So if you have a group of students who are committed to watching the videos together, then you still they still could learn a lot. Okay. Good to know, Matt. How long is the the summer school? Is this like? Uh... Uh, I think last time it was eight days. Okay. So it's, it's a, it's, it should be a nice jumping off point 
for people who want to get a, a jump start in deep learning. So could CMC get involved actually, Hugh, and have something like some uh, workshops for students where they can learn not only about some deep learning algorithms, but perhaps how to implement on tools existing or infrastructure existing from CMC side. Because the problem that I see on your side, Hugh, is that you can provide a lot of infrastructure, if, but if it is not fully utilized because it's getting more and more complex for the students to, mm -hmm. to use it, then, then again, there is a gap that somehow needs to be bridged. It's the, the same like the gap that the students have for the first time learning how to use Xilinx compi com uh, compilation tools, for instance, yeah? Yeah, yeah, there's, I mean, I think there's definitely a training a kind of, Yeah, a large training even before being able to do very simple things. Yeah. Sure, yeah. I think we can definitely play a role there. I think even open source helps. I mean, you know, um, if faculty members are ready to share their tools, uh, you know, the uh, different plugins that they have uh, created, this would be a very good way of learning how to, you know, implement and integrate machine learning and deep learning within uh, any EDA tool. Uh, mm -hmm. So um, I think we should. Um, you know, uh, encourage faculty members to to have their uh, work and, uh, and, and EDA flows uh, to be open source. This would uh, be very helpful to everyone. Yeah, and maybe there's a way for CMC to make you know raise awareness of, of these projects as well. Um, Absolutely, yeah. Hi, Lala. Hello. Hi. <laughs> Sorry, I was referring to your presentation before when we were discussing about uh, imagination in machine learning and uh, the fact that there is still a place where our engineers actually seem to do better, but they don't have the, they do, cannot get the right models back from the machine learning algorithms. Yeah. I think actually what Matt said uh, that uh, the, the combination of the engineers and the machines will probably be the best way to go is, uh, is where it is, uh, where we should be headed. Uh, I know with Watson, that is what they found with the doctors. Like they, they changed what uh, Watson was a computer that won the game of Jeopardy. And then they by trying to put it as a medical diagnosis device. And they found that when they had it work with the doctors that had the best outcomes. And I don't know what happened after that, but uh, this was a few years ago. But I think that would be probably where we will go. I think, I think that's true of, of medical image analysis as well, that you, are, you don't want a, a, an agent trying to find cancer, but uh, an agent doing vision and uh, machine vision plus a doctor is going to have better results than just the doctor. Uh, there's a question in the chat. Has anyone looked at using FPGAs to run many of the interesting algorithms to improve the EDA flow? Anybody looked at, at that? I've had some students uh, build uh, hardware accelerators for some of the machine learning. So I don't think that is uh, directly related to the EDA, but I think the question is more of, have we been able to accelerate any of the EDA flows? Is that what it is? Has anyone looked yeah, at- Yeah, I guess accelerate algorithms for EDA using MPGAs. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, I've had some good experience in the past uh, where we created uh, several hardware accelerators uh, for routing, uh, uh, using also for some meta heuristics that have been used for uh, the EDA flow, like uh, partitioning. Um, but uh, in the, uh, I've been paying more attention to the actual you know, problems within the EDA flow rather than the hardware accelerators lately. We've done lots of work in, in the area of design exploration uh, in terms of uh, you know finding the you know best architecture. There was a presentation today on design exploration, so along those lines, 
uh, and also, you know, uh, exhilarating them using FPGAs, um, but not anymore. Have you run inference uh, on on the FPGAs for for any of the networks you've? Yeah, uh, uh, you, you're talking about specifically machine learning algorithms that are mapped on FPGAs, correct? Yeah, mapping the the network in, into an FPGA and then running inference. Yeah, yeah. We had, uh, as I said, we had. I had several students who um, were involved in uh, developing and implementing. Uh, deep learning techniques, specifically, you know, NLPs on FPGAs. Uh, we had uh, uh, a contract with Weiwei uh, back in 2016, I think 2015, 2016, um, myself and Graham Taylor. And uh, it was quite interesting and successful. So uh, we managed to cut down on the uh, training time. And that was the objective of the time. Okay, we've got a few minutes left. Um, uh, sorry about my dog. Don't worry. Um, <laughs> I, just, I just got back from a walk. <laughs> um, so it, does anyone have any uh, last questions before we, we wrap up? Well, we'd like, to, we'd like to thank you, first of all, for inviting us. And I think it's a good opportunity to know others who are working in the area. And even though it's coming at the time when we have our final exams, <laughs> yesterday I had one final exam, and this week I have another final exam. So the timing wasn't really correct, Hugh. Maybe next time we do it in October, November. Yeah, I, I know we're, we're looking at uh, Yassine, who some of you may know, uh, is, is looking at organizing a, another workshop, um, I guess maybe more general workshop on AI in, in the February, March kind of That's time. That's great. So, uh, keep a lookout for that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I'd, I'd definitely like to thank uh, everyone for taking the time uh, to, to present and to, and to attend this. And, and as well, I'd like to thank Huawei for, for supporting and, and in fact, uh, I guess suggesting this as a, as a topic area for, for uh, a, a workshop. And uh, I'd just like to thank everyone for, for joining. Thank you so much, Hugh. You have a good day. And thank you so much, guys. You have a good day. Yeah. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you. Bye. Nice to meet everybody.